uh, welcome to uh, our program called Local Government, a Citizen's Guide. This program is uh, hosted by the Friends of Samuels Library. Um, I represent San the Friends, so uh, again, welcome. I'm going to introduce the speakers, but before I do that, I want to point out on the table back here is a uh, membership application for the Friends, if you should want to join. The Friends um, supports the library in a, in a couple different ways. Membership uh, dues go to support the library financially, so if you join, your dues will go to the library. We also operate the bookstore out here in the entrance area, uh, which uh, profits go to the library as well. We, um, we also help with uh, programming <coughs> such as this. So that's, that's what the Friends do, and, and I hope you'll consider joining. There's a, a little bit more information over there on the table, the mission statement and some of the accomplishments that um, uh, the Friends have been able to achieve over the last year. I also have two flyers about two upcoming programs. At uh, the end of this month, we'll have a beekeeping program, the, the basics of, of beekeeping. And there's also, and next month, a winter nature photography po program. So feel free to pick up those brochures, uh, flyers uh, that you can take home with you and attach to your calendar as a reminder. Sorry. So, uh, right now I'm going to introduce the speakers. Uh, first, uh, I'll introduce Joe Waltz. Joe has been the town manager, the town manager for Front Royal, for two years. Prior to that, he was uh, the uh, director of uh, uh, director of electric, electric. Uh, in two, and he started that position in 2005. Um, he has a bachelor's in science and business, uh, so um, he is uh, well versed in the operation of the town. Doug Stanley is the Warren County uh, Administrator, and he has been at that post since April 2000. <coughs> he has a bachelor's in geography from Mary Washington College and a master's degree in urban and regional <coughs> planning from Virginia Commonwealth University, and a graduate certificate in public administration from Shenandoah University. So those are our two speakers. And I'm going to turn it over to them so that they can uh, begin the presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Yes. All right, good. I didn't really want to use a mic. Mike, can you hear me? Mike, Mike, Mike. Um, just want to let y'all know, uh, very informal. As we go through the slides, if you got a question, I may not have the answer, but I will get back to you. Uh, me and Doug are going to split it up a little bit. Uh, I'm going to talk for a little while. I'm going to talk about local government as it pertains to the town of Front Royal. And then I'll talk about our departments. And then Doug will step in and, and do the same for the county. And then we'll come back around and we'll talk about current projects. I've got a, a current picture of our new council for the town of Front Royal that took seat in, on January 1st with the addition of Chris Holloway, Latasha Thompson, and Gary Gillespie. So this is uh, the agenda for today. I'm going to talk about local government, then we're going to talk about the departments that make up our government, uh, then we'll talk about current and future projects, and then at last, and how to get involved if you want to get involved in local government. Uh, first, take a step back. The town was chartered uh, in 1788, November 15, 1788, uh, chartered by the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, we currently serve about approximately 15,000 citizens in the corporate lands, and our service territory is 10 and a half square miles. Uh, it's important to recognize that Virginia is a Dillon Rule state, which basically means that the Commonwealth, the state of Virginia, establishes and confers our local government power. This means unless the Commonwealth, the state of Virginia, has acted to allow the town to exercise certain powers, the town cannot regula regulate a certain activity. 
To give an example of this, if you've been watching the news lately, or in the past year, year and a half, Council has been working on a rental inspection property maintenance program. We did not have that power in our charter to go to the to go to the measures that other cities had. So we had let's, we had a delegate Collins go down to the legislature and get that put into our charter, and we have, were able to get that into our charter last July 1st. So now that we have the power to address blighted structures and derelict structures, we now have that power, and so now we're working on getting something together to get a property maintenance program together. Uh, this is a, a nice little uh, map of Town of Front Royal. And the thing to remember is if you look in the very pink section, <coughs> these are the years that were incorporated into the town. And there's this section right here in downtown, circle downtown, was in 1921. Then it wasn't until 1949 that the town incorporated all this area in here, the rural village, and, and back here in Marlow Heights. And in 76, down, uh, and it's this portion here between the bridges and as well as the eastern part of town here. And then in 78, we closed in this piece, which is in the Happy Creek area. And then recently, in 2014, we annexed 600 acres over here uh, into our corporate limits. So it's always, it's a, it's a really cool map to show how the town has grown over the years. Um, wanted to take another step and talk about local governments. You have towns, cities, and counties. I represent a town, the town of Front Royal. Doug represents the county of Warren, but there's also the city. But what I'm going to talk about are two basic forms of government that people use between a city and a town. One is called a mayor council form of government, and the other one is called a council manager form of government. Now, the mayor council form of government, now this nationally, 43% of the cities nationwide use this type of government. Um, and basically, the mayor, the elected mayor, has the executive and administrative authority to operate that government. Instead of having a town manager, the mayor has that power. If you've been watching the news about what's going on in Stevens City and with the mayor, what you're seeing there is Stephen City is going transitioning from this, a mayor council form of government, to the other one, which is the council manager form of government. Stephen City has gotten to a size big enough now that the mayor technically does not have the time to dedicate to run that government. You will see in smaller towns in uh, Virginia that mainly have 4,000 residents, they will have that mayor council form of government because their government is small, easy to control. So this is what the town front role uses. We use a council manager form of government. The citizens elect town council. Town council hires the town manager. The town manager manages the staff, do what needs to be done for the government. Town staff reports to me. I report to council and ultimately council reports to the citizens. It's just a neat little thing. It's, it, I look at it as almost like a, a corporation. The citizens are your board, or council is your board. And so. uh, just some quick uh, things about it. Uh, council is made up of six members. Um, there are staggered elections every two years. We just had an election last year. <coughs> um, the mayor is elected every two years, though. Um, the mayor is the official head of town council. That is Hollis Stark. Uh, he was re-elected again in November. The mayor actually sets the agendas on what's going to be discussed at the meetings, and he obviously presides at every meetings. The vice mayor, now the vice mayor, uh, our new vice mayor, uh, uh, Gene T. Walt was our vice mayor last year. They just nominated their new vice mayor, and that is Bill Selaw. Now the vice mayor is chosen every two years, and, and does official duties in the absence of the mayor. So. Now, town council, they only have three employees. They have a clerk of council, a town attorney, and a town manager. The clerk of council is basically the interface between the public and town council. She's responsible for the distribution of town council agenda and minutes, 
You see, sir, as a liaison between the council and, and, and uh, the public. Uh, this is Jennifer Barry. She's held this position, held this position maybe over 10 years now. Our town attorney, which is Doug Napier, uh, he provides legal counsel not just to the mayor, to the council, but he also provides legal advice to me as well as staff. Uh, integral part. And then uh, me and I serve as chief administrative officer uh, for the town. Right. Now I'm going to change gears and talk a little bit about all the departments to make up the town. Uh, first I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about general administration. I've got two areas. I've got general administration that's supported by tax dollars. <coughs> and then what we call the enterprise fund, which is supported by the service fee. So when I'm talking about enterprise funds, I'm talking about your electric, your water, your sewer, and your trash. No tax dollars go to those business units. Those are supported by the service fees they charge. It's important to remember. General administration, these are things that are, are, are funded through your tax dollars. Finance, obviously, to handle finance and human resources, police, community development, public works, IT, planning, zoning, and tourism. Um, finance department, we're located right there on Main Street, right across from the courthouse at 102 East Main Street. Um, I got a contact number up there. Our hours are Monday to Friday from 8 to 4.30. Uh, we do operate the drive through uh, on Saturdays as well, and that does get some use. And that's good. And we do this with staff of 14 employees. Uh, and the finance department is not just customer service. They uh, handle all the billing. They send out all the bills. For all the utility accounts. Um, they handle all the purchasing within our town. And, um, and then they handle the meter reading. Uh, for an example, our meter readers probably read approximately 15,000 meters a month. And so you figure that's 15,000 accounts that you're billing out there for the bill. So they're actively um, doing, uh, sending bills and receiving money. All right, our human resources department. Uh, we've got we've got a lot of jobs open. Uh, you can come into the uh, main office there, go upstairs to Human Resources. We've got a portal. This is a portal with some of the jobs open. Um, we recently did a compensation study uh, about a year and a half ago, and uh, we were able to adjust our rates a little bit. We increased our minimum wage to 11.78 to bring it up to a living wage, um, but we're still looking for help. So I'm gonna throw out that little thing there. You know anybody that wants to get in a career such as wastewater treatment plant? Don't need to have any experience, just willingness to work on around the clock. Or uh, if, if you so desire to work for our solid waste division. Those are two divisions. I have nine positions opening right now between those two divisions. Risk management. This is important, uh, particularly like for the last snowstorm. Um, our risk management department not just handles all the safety within all our departments, but they also ensure that we have adequate insurance coverage. Um, they also do all our accident investigations. It's very important that every incident or accident is investigated to improve our, improve our safety policy. But risk management, the number up there, the reason I give you that number is to support any claims or claims against management. It's important we do get those claims if we were to fall on if you were down like at the gazebo area and you fell and you and it was due to that infrastructure, you would want to report that. Information technology. Um, this has really grown exponentially because if you look at the couple of pictures there on the left, the body cameras, body cameras and in-car cameras for the police. Huge data. Um, Police, all, all police, all patrol officers wear a body camera, as well as their car cameras running all the time. We have to store all that data. We run 24-7, our police department runs 24-7, so imagine all that video getting stored and we have to save it. And so our IT department has grown from not just connecting building to building and getting to the internet, it's storing all this video. Planning and zoning. Pretty self-explanatory there. Uh, they do planning, code management, uh, customer service, GIS, and boards and commissions. And I'll get a little bit more into boards and commissions 
when I talk about how you can get involved in government by joining one of these boards or commissions. Public Works. Um, Public Works is located right down there by Bing Crosby <coughs> Stadium. This is one of the biggest apartments I have, staff of 78 employees. And you got to remember what they handle. They handle streets, asphalt, concrete. They perform paving, potholes, street repairs. We do bridge maintenance ourselves, street sweeping. You can see the street sweeper down there on the right. That street sweeper uh, drives over 100 miles a week. He's on the road eight hours a day making his path around three town. He covers every road in one week's time. Uh, we also do our own snow removal and ice removal on town streets and, and parking lots and sidewalks. We do our own uh, concrete with sidewalks, curb and gutter, storm drain installations. We maintain um, 65.7 miles of streets and 92 miles of storm sewer. We do this with just a staff of 13. And you can imagine, like on the last snowstorm we had um, last, last weekend, staff of 13 wasn't enough to plow snow. So what we do is we bring other individuals within our team from other departments, and we operate as a team, and we get the roads plowed. Public Works also handles all the sign names. We have two employees, and that's all they do. We fabricate our own signs on site, and we install them. Uh, we also, they do crosswalks. And I'll be talking about crosswalks in a little bit because it's uh, something that uh, we're really trying to make an effort on pedestrian safety. And I'll get to that in a minute. We also started this year trying to do some town-wide uh, curb painting um, to designate where you can't park on main, on main line streets. Um, we do a restriping and new paving every year. Um, sometimes that is a, uh, an ordeal. You may get behind somebody who's paint in the road, but you know, you just got to bear with them. Uh, we do this every year. We come in and we three stripes. It's important. Uh, horticulture. This right here, uh, this tells the tale with the baskets in the summertime. And a bunch of volunteers do this with Ann. And, um, but horticulture, they, they have, uh, they're responsible for all the mowing. Um, Weed eating, tractor mowing on all town property. That's like down Commerce and any of there. Like Lee's Run Parkway, they're going to have to start mowing that. There's a lot of activity there, and they do this with four full time employees and three seasonals. Um, but they also, like you can see, they maintain all the flowers that go up and down Main Street, uh, and they also uh, maintain the Greenway Trail, which I'll talk about down the as well. But uh, they take great pride in those, in those baskets. Fleet management, uh, obviously pretty, pretty standard. Uh, we, we have over 242 pieces of equipment. I mean, we have uh, bucket trucks, trash trucks, police cars, dump trucks, and so it's a lot. Uh, we, we have a staff of five employees. We do our own maintenance, perform state inspections and all types of preventive maintenance. Construction administration, uh, you can see here, these three pictures on the side here are leads from Parkway, where we uh, construction management, uh, construction administration reviews and inspects all public improvements within town limits and county where water and sewer are provided um, for compliance with towns and the standards and specs. We also oversee any uh, uh, contractors for large town projects. And we locate lines for mission utilities. And uh, okay. community and development, community development and tourism. Um, this here is a gem of our community. And I'm, I'm, I'm always impressed when I go down there um, that this visitor center is open seven days a week for 362 days a year. And they do this with four part-timers and 10 volunteers. And, and that amazes me that people are dedicated to want to share their knowledge of Front Royal and help visitors to come to our community. But that is astonishing that they do that, keep that place open, which is four part-timers and ten volunteers. I want to talk about our Front Royal trolley. It is getting quite a bit of use. Um, we just recently installed a bus shelter over there um, Across the street here in front of the private apartments. And uh, um, 
we, we hope to install some more bus shelters. But the trolley is getting used. Uh, you can see where it's trending up. Um, I think when you look at some of the trends, I don't have November and December on here, I don't think. But they are trending up, and, uh, and people are using it, and that's good. We're getting a lot of good response to this. All right, our Front Row Police Department. Our current location is on 23 East Jackson Street. Our new location will be on 900 Monroe Avenue. Um, Non-emergency contact number 625-2111. That's an important number to remember because after hours, if you have a, an issue with public works, got an electric issue, water issue, any issue with the town, if you don't get a number at the office, you call that 635-2111 and they will handle you. That is their job. That is our police dispatch, but they also handle all calls relating to town business. And we do this with a staff of 55. Obviously, we've got our uniform patrol service, we've got motorcycles, we got bikes. Try to put the bikes back uh, this last summer for when we we're doing festivals and stuff. Um, just to give you an idea, we, we broke the town down in three different divisions, uh, whether they call them patrol sectors. Uh, it's a division of workload, but and also a division of workload and faster response. But the whole thing is, is for the officer to become accustomed to the residents and business owners within their assigned response area. And so it works out well. We also got our canine operations. We got two dogs right now. We, our newest one is a Hungarian black lab, and uh, his name is um, Matt. Top dog. <laughs> uh, and uh, Bosco is the other dog. Um, we also have an emergency services team, which is 10 tactical officers and three crisis negotiators. Something you don't want to have or use, but it's nice if you need it. Uh, they have to do 50 hours of basic training for initial assignment. They do about 100 hours of uh, on job, ongoing training throughout the year. Uh, specialized training areas of high risk, warrant service, hostage rescue, barricade subjects, and crisis negotiations. Average call outs a year is about 10 of these, but not well publicized. Detective Division, uh, we've got four detectives. They do criminal investigation of narcotics. Believe it or not, out of our detectives, each of them handle about approximately 50 different cases currently. So there's a lot of active cases they're working on, and not just you know, not just doing one case like you see in the, in the, on TV. They've got 50 cases they're working on, and we bring a lot to conclusion, and that's good. Our communication center. This is our first point of contact to the public, even for law enforcement. Or as I was stating earlier, if you have any problem in town and you're not getting an answer from the main office, you can call that number. But this staff of nine communication officers man the <coughs> call center 24 hours a day. Um, police are heavily involved in community involvement. Um, they support over two dozen community events, parades, wine and craft, festival leaves, dancing downtown, zombie walks, 5K races, and all that. They're out there, and, uh, and uh, they enjoy it as well. And it's, it's good for... It's good for, for them to mingle with the citizens. All right, now I'm going to talk about enterprise funds. Now, these are the ones that are not tax dollars, do not go. Actually, tax, uh, actually, money from these services flow back to the general administration. And the reason that is, is because the finance department, they are handling the billing for these, so you, they have to pay for that bill. They're also, the administration is purchasing for these people. So you have to pay for that. So there's a, what they call a, a transfer. First thing I want to talk to you about is our water service. We, we service over 6,000 residents here in town and uh, out in the county. Uh, we maintain 119 miles of water lines. We maintain 712 fire hydrants, and we do this with a staff of eight. Uh, you look at the top right there with the fire hydrants. Um, we, um, we exercise those twice a year. 
for several reasons. One, to make sure they're operable and ready to be used. And number two, it gets the water moving in the system and, and does not allow any stagnant water to, to develop. It's good to get that water moving around in the system. Um, our water treatment plant. Um, believe it or not, we get our water. Main water source is the South Fork of Shenandoah River. We pump that water two miles to get to this plant uphill. Uh, you can see that big lake in the back. That's ten, that lake will ha hold 10 million gallons of untreated water. So what we do is we pump the water up from the river, we put it in that lake, and that lake just sits there, and they draw upon that lake. And if you look up the top piece, top piece, that is the train. That's where the water comes in, and it starts going through the process of getting it clean. And then you have, once it's processed and clean, we have two live wells, they call them live wells down here, 750,000 gallons each of fresh, ready water to go before it goes out into the system. We are permitted from DEQ to pull water out of the river, uh, for, uh, permitted to supply 4 million gallons a day. We uh, currently use, like I said, currently use about 2.3, so we've got quite a bit of room for growth. The, the facility itself is actually built to handle 6 uh, million gallons a day, so when you look at where we are <coughs> capacity-wise at the plant, we're good for the future. Um, we also have um, four storage tanks throughout the community. Um, and we do this with 12 employees. This plant runs 24-7 a day as well. Sewer service. Uh, we service 5,915 residents. We maintain 123 miles of sewer line. And we do that with a staff of eight. Now, the staff of eight is also the water service as well. And, uh, and here's our new wastewater treatment plant. We just finished this last year. Uh, it, it's currently treating about 3.8 million gallons a day. The plant capacity is 5.3, and that is what our permit's for. So our capacity at our plant is 5.3 million gallons a day, and that's what our permit's for. One of the things that they did was is um, we received septage from the county, and they built this area back here that allows the septic college to come in through a gate any time of the day, 24-7, and, and, uh, and get rid of their hall. This is, um, excuse me, that, it's going to go off until I hit it. I apologize. All right. Um, Where's that little kid? Uh, this is okay. You know where uh, the recycling place is off of Manassas? Um, down where you take your brush, mm -hmm. it's right there at Charles Railroad Tracks. It's on the left, the electric department's on the right, and you go straight on down to the and then. Mm -hmm. uh, Solid waste. Um, this is another enterprise fund. It collects and we recycle for about 5,780 residents and businesses. We collect yard waste and tree trimmings. Um, and then we have the farm site, which is right next to the wastewater treatment plant. And uh, that's where you can bring brush down and you can also bring some white goods down. Our uh, solid waste, we do this with staff of 13. This is where I got five positions open. So if you know anybody who wants to work, please send them my way. All right, Energy Services Department, they're located right across the street from the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, they've got a staff of 16 employees. Um, they maintain all the electric in town. They maintain all the street lights. Um, traffic lights, crosswalks, um, they do meter testing, banner replacement, they do the Christmas decorations, anything else that's in there. Um, one of the things that we're somewhat proud of is the solar farm that we installed back there on the farm, which is right here. Uh, it's about, it's two and a half megawatts. And what it basically serves, it serves about 300 homes. And, um, What's interesting is that is, it's on 15 acres, and it's made up of over 10,000 solar panels. And to give you an idea, a solar panel is six feet by four feet. So you have seen the tractor trailers rolling in when they were bringing these in. But uh, free energy, in a sense, you have the capital outlay, but it's about half the cost because your your source of your source is free. Free. So you just have that small capital, and uh, it's been very good. 
been very good at uh, product. The only problem is it's about 2% of all our needs. So even though it's great, it doesn't cover us everywhere. Before I let Doug take anybody got any questions? I know I went through it fast. Uh, I, um, I live in 22630 zip code. Uh, I have no garbage pickup, and my front royal is my address. Uh, can I still call that uh, 6352111 number for help? Um, I live in a place called River Mont. That's County. That's County, yeah. So who is my representative? Well, I'll take care of it. There's no ducks coming up on the county <laughs> side. So can I still call the 6352111 number? You can call, we'll answer it. If we can't help you, we'll point you in the right direction. Yeah, that's, you know. Any other questions? All right, so we're doing a little bit of a tag team here, so I'm going to come up and start talking about county government here in just a little bit. A little bit of trivia first. Raise your hand if you live inside the limits of the town of Front Royal. Raise your hand if you live in Warren County. Some of you got it. It's a trick question because if you live in the town of Front Royal, you also live in the county of Warren. Um, as Joe talked about, there are three forms of governments, towns, cities, and counties. And Virginia is a little unique. Towns are part of counties, but cities aren't. Cities like Winchester. Winchester is the whole of the donut in Frederick County. The city of Winchester is completely 100% separate from Frederick <coughs> County. Um, if I live in Atlanta, Georgia, odds are I live in either Fulton County or Cobb County, Georgia. Um, I'm still part of the underlying county uh, in Atlanta. Man, your question, and I'll, I'll get to it in a second, but you're out in Rivermont, so you're out in the county outside of town limits. Um, Mr. Archie Fox is your supervisor, um, and the, the Warren County Sheriff's Office, I think it's 635-4128, but they have a non-emergency number as well that you can call with issues. You can also call the County Administrator's Office at 636-4600. Again, we can point you in any direction of any question. Um, and it's not unusual, you know, you, you're out in the county, a deer's kilt in front of your, uh, hit by a car right in front of your house. You don't, maybe not, don't know who to call. You can call us. We'll call the Virginia Department of Transportation that handles that and try to get that taken care of for you. Um, a couple other questions. So, does anybody know when Warren County was formed? Somebody pick a guess. 1788. That's the town. Not too far off. Maybe eight, it's about 50, 48 years off. You can try. You get a county pen. 1836. Warren County was actually kind of a newcomer. Um, you know, the town was already established. Warren County was part of what, the current Warren County is part of what two other counties? It was parts of two other counties that were taken away and formed to create Warren County. It's part of Frederick and part of Shenandoah County. So you can imagine if you live down in Browntown and if you had to go to the courthouse to get a marriage license, you had to slog all the way over to Woodstock to the courthouse, which there used to be a way to go over the mountain to get over there. So it's a long way. And a lot of folks on, from here north had to actually go to Winchester, to Frederick County Courthouse. And during the winter, there'd be a couple months, maybe, where you were flooded out on the other side and you couldn't get back and forth across, so it created a hardship. And those are part of the reasons why uh, the citizens of this area lobbied the General Assembly for about 30 years to create a separate county. And uh, in 1836, two counties were formed, Clark and Warren. And um, one of the unique things is uh, they had drawn the boundaries, gone to Richmond, and they were getting ready to finalize it at the last minute um, the General Assembly said, you know what, we're not sure if there's enough, if Warren County is going to be financially successful enough. So they took 
some land from what was going to be Clark and added it to Warren. And what was, what was the big economic engine in 1836? It was agriculture. So they took the farmland around the Rockland area and added it to Warren, took it away from Clark. Because the rest of Warren County doesn't have a whole lot of great farmland. But in those days, farmland generated products, generated capital. That's how what made Warren County a little more economic. It's ironic today because things like the power plant and uh, Cisco and DuPont, all those facilities out on 522 North, which are today our economic engine, are part of Warren because of that last minute maneuver in 1836 when the General Assembly created Warren County. So we're going to talk a little bit about the county form of government, constitutional officers, uh, delivery county services, and then uh, Joe will come back up and talk about town projects, and I'll come back up and talk about county projects and also how citizens can become involved in boards and commissions. So, as Joe said, um, under the Code of Virginia, there are three forms of government, towns, cities, and counties. There are also some variations within each particular form. Most counties in Virginia operate under what's called the county board form of government, where we have a board of supervisors, and basically they're in charge, but they can delegate some of that authority. So the board can function both as a legislative and an administrative committee, both making policy and carrying it out, depending upon whether a chief administrator has been appointed. That did not happen in Warren County until I believe around 1972, 73 in that time frame. It's the first time they had an administrator. Until that point, the board pretty much did everything. And they would sit there and they would review a $2.30 bill for new brooms that were purchased for the courthouse. And they would go through all those bills at their bi-weekly meetings. As you can imagine, things like Joe said, things get a little bit more complicated and you need staff to carry those out. So the board retains responsibility for appointments of County Administrative Officers employees except those appointed by constitutional officers, boards, and agencies. So, we have a Board of Supervisors, five members. I'm pleased today to have Mr. Dan Murdy, please raise your hand. Dan is the Chairman of the Board of Supervisors as of uh, our meeting on January the 8th, the 2019 year. Uh, he is one of five members. Uh, our members serve staggered terms, four-year terms. So uh, Mr. Murray and two of the other members are up this year and will run for re-election this November. And those terms will be from January of 2020 through December 31 of 2024. Um, and then in two years, we have two of the other members will be up for election. Our election districts, uh, Happy Creek, this great area, actually the smallest because it's the most dense, one of the unique things, every time we go through a census, every 10 years, we have to redistrict because each of these districts must be within plus or minus about 5% of variance and equal population. So our community has about 40,000 people. We'll hit that threshold here probably in the next year. So you've got to have a population for the five of that 8,000 people or so, and then it really boils down to uh, registered voters. But we have the North River, or excuse me, Happy Creek. The South River is this pink at the bottom, the largest area, because a lot of the South River District has things like Skyline Drive and Shenandoah National Park and Andy Guest State Park that don't have a lot of <laughs> population. But land area-wise, about 40% of the county is in the South River Election District. We have the Fork District, 102, out here on the left, and the kind of the orange. That's your district. Where I live. That's Mr. Fox. <laughs> Mr. Murray's district is the green up top, North River. Uh, one of the interesting things that we have is that each of our election districts comes into town. So Mr. Murray has a slice of the town, so that town, each of the uh, districts has a portion of town residents as well that are part of their district. Um, and then lastly, we have the Shenandoah district. That's Mr. Sayre. Comes into town, includes the Rockland and the Shenandoah Farms area there in blue. Uh, the county. So five election districts, our, our county website has a geographic information system. You can go in there and you can plug in your address and you can figure out what your election district is, what your school districts are, all that information is there as well. 
<clears throat> so the, the county administrator, uh, much like the town manager, uh, responsible for carrying out day-to-day -day activities of the county, um, I'm delegated as little or as much authority as the board wants to give me. Some days I wish I didn't have as much, and, and, uh, but uh, basically the day-to-day -day activities, I carry out the direction of the board. They set policy, it's my job to carry it out for them. <coughs> um, so you're basically the chief executive officer, execute policies established by the board or mandated by the state, uh, prepare and administer the budget, Supervise the organization's departments, uh, represent the governing body, interpret the governing body's actions to the public and to other bodies or groups. Sometimes it's easy, especially if I have all five of my board members who are for a particular issue. Some other things, it could be a three to two vote, so it didn't have to switch from one year to the next. So it gets a little dicey sometimes, but that's my job, is to basically represent the majority voice of the board of supervisors and what their desires are. Um, my job is to be an advisor to the governing body, provide project management, uh, help manage the public agenda, be a spokesperson at things like today's event, uh, be a team builder to work with the staff to try to get them working in one direction. Um, sometimes you have to be a change agent and uh, over the years, uh, policy advisor to the board, help them, if they have an idea, help them craft that, and, and be a promoter of the community. Um, Every month, we have people looking to come and invest in, in Front Row of Warren County. Joe and I's job is to help sell this community to them and why Front Row of Warren County is a great place to live, to raise a family, possibly work, or have a business. So the role of the county, and this is kind of one of the things going with town, is I got a call last week and said, I have to pay town taxes. Why are you making me pay county taxes too? So I have to go through the whole idea and the concept of, really because we provide different services. And if you look at our stuff that I'm gonna talk about <coughs> versus what Joe talked about, really and truthfully, there's not a whole lot of overlap on what we do. Um, but the role of the county is to provide constituents with basic services to protect and promote the public health, safety, and welfare. Services ensure education of our children basic law enforcement and fire and rescue services, trash disposal, um, to make sure that buildings are constructed to minimum standards, uh, provide park and rec opportunities, and help direct the orderly growth of our community. And those are just kind of the basic things. Um, and some of the differences between town and county is that there's differing levels of service provided by each. And uh, really starts to become a little more blurred as the county starts to look more suburban. Um, when you get um, curb and gutter and streets out in the county and people wanting trash pickup, it starts to look more like town sometimes. So one of the differences between the town and the county is that we have something called constitutional officers. Um, these folks are elected at large by the voters of the county. And they'll let you know that too. <laughs> Uh, they serve four-year terms of office, except the clerk of the circuit court who serves a term of eight years. So, with the exception of the clerk, all the others that I'm going to talk about will be up for election this November. Localities, we pay the salaries of the constitutional officers to, like the sheriff, we, we pay them, we're reimbursed uh, by the state, and uh, we're reimbursed for the salaries, a part of the salaries of their officers that work underneath them. States set salaries, approve job classifications. Counties are allowed to supplement those salaries and pay more than the state minimum, which we do here in Warren County, partly because of the influence of Northern Virginia, uh, which drives the cost of wages up. First one is the uh, clerk of the circuit court, Mr. Darrell Funk. He handles judicial proceedings and acts as a general record keeper for the county relating to land transfers, deeds, deeds of trust, mortgages, births, deaths, wills, divorces, election results, marriages, hunting, fishing, licenses. He is the custodian and record keeper at the courthouse. Uh, also, basically staff of the circuit court, uh, who um, uh, discharges, obviously, a lot of the uh, civil cases and larger um, criminal cases. Treasurer. Treasurer of Warren County, Ms. Wanda Bryant. 
Her job is collection, custody, and disbursement of county funds. So when you write your check, typically to pay your real estate or personal property taxes to the county of Warren, you'll make it payable to the treasurer of Warren County. <coughs> when the county pays its bills, we have a finance department that you know, basically runs accounts payable and processes the checks, but the checks come from the treasurer. She's the one responsible legally in Virginia for disbursement of funds. Um, Wanda's uh, position's up this year. I'm not sure. She hasn't made an announcement whether she's going to run or not. She's probably been the county close to 40 years, so it'll be interesting to see if she decides to, to run or not. But uh, Wanda's been a great public servant, and I've enjoyed to work with her over the past 24 years. Commissioner of the Revenue, um, Ms. Sherry Sowers. Uh, it's her job to prepare real estate, personal property, and tax books. She assesses real property improvements that are added to the land books between general reassessments uh, to assess the fair market value machinery tools and personal property. Uh, she issues county business license. And I say that if I live in town and have a business in town, uh, Mr. McCool's business, he has a town business license. If I have a business out in the county that's operating, I have a county business license. Uh, that used to not be the case. There was a point in time, up to maybe about five years ago, you had to have a license for both if you operated in the town. That's since been changed. But uh, they also, uh, again, enforcement of remittance collection of food and beverage tax and transient occupancy tax outside of town limits as well. Commonwealth's attorney, Mr. Brian Manton, uh, he is responsible for matters involving enforcement of criminal law within the county. So basically, it's his job to um, charge and prosecute people with criminal offenses. Kind of the one exception, the town enforces the violations of town traffic laws and stuff. They have a uh, town attorney processes those under the town code. Uh, by doing that, the town's able to collect the fines uh, in court. So that's one of the few exceptions. The sheriff, Sheriff Danny McKeithrin. Uh, is the Chief Law Enforcement Officer of the County, provides security for the court and district courts, and upon request of meetings of the Board of Supervisors. Sheriff McKeithrin has announced his retirement at the end of this year, so there will be um, a primary election process to determine candidates to run for office this fall. Um, uh, prior to Danny, he had uh, Lynn Armantrout, who was there for a long time, so that, that's another position that's been real stable for the county uh, for a long time. Uh, one of the, th the changes that occurred back in 2014 uh, is the county, along with Shenandoah and Rapid County, has opened the RSW Regional Jail, um, and we were able to close our local jail. The local jail used to be operating underneath the sheriff, so that's one of the things that uh, basically came away from his jurisdiction. He still serves on the Regional Jail Authority Board, but uh, he's not personally responsible for the jail anymore. There are nine departments under the supervision of the county administrator. Uh, Department of Building Inspections, County Administration, Finance and Purchasing, Fire and Rescue, General Services, Parks and Recreation, Planning and Zoning, Public Works and Social Services. <coughs> you can't see this, that's okay. But basically it's a chart, but like Joe showed, that basically you've got the public at the top and the Board of Supervisors. The two- Jessica, the back up please. Jessica, the back up please. The two employees of the Board of Supervisors, or the County Administrator, and County Attorney, Mr. Dan Whitten. The, the Board is directly responsible for hiring them. All the other folks are under the County Administrator or under the Constitutional Officer, um, but similar to the town in relation to the setup. So Building Inspections Department, their job is to protect health, safety, and welfare of the residents of the county and the town because we do provide uh, building inspection services in town as it pertains to the Uniform Statewide Building Code. <coughs> Their job to make sure building structures should be permitted to be constructed at least possible cost, and while keeping consistent with recognized standards of health, safety, energy conservation, order conservation, and erosion incentive control, provide efficient, courteous, and friendly service to the public. <coughs> Regulate construction of work that is mandated in the Uniform Statewide Building Code in the Virginia Erosion Subject Control Handbook. Regulate activities, again, in the county and the town, both. Um, they provide answers to technical code-related questions. We have a lot of folks that are 
kind of weekend warriors like to build their own decks and additions and garages. <coughs> folks help them walk them through that process to help them with that. Um, and we perform investigation of violations of the building code when a written complaint is received or found. We have six full-time and two part-time employees uh, in that department. County administration on a daily and uh, weekly basis, we provide general <coughs> information to staff, boards, and commissions and provide public support to the Board of Supervisors. We handle general inquiries from citizens with county services, respond to citizen complaints and concerns, provide general overall supervision of the building inspection, park and rec, planning, finance, solid waste and disposal, fire and rescue, and I'll add general services and public works as well as social service. We handle uh, personnel issues. The HR is basically embedded within administration. And we supervise uh, solid waste collection, disposal, building maintenance, and sign replacement. Uh, and act as county liaison to various state and federal departments and agencies. On an annual basis, um, one of the biggest things we do is work with staff and the public to develop the county's annual budget, which we're currently in the process of. And the board will be having one of its first work sessions here in a couple weeks with outside agencies. Uh, we work with staff and the public to develop our uh, biannual capital improvement plan of all the list of uh, projects that we intend to build over a two-year period and implement the goals of the Board of Supervisors. That's one of the things the Board does each year is review its goals list and come up with goals uh, for the staff and the county for the upcoming year. We have seven full-time employees. Finance Department, uh, basically responsible uh, for maintaining county records for all county departments and offices, process payroll, process vendor payments or accounts payable for all purchases, uh, develop the annual budget. Uh, they also are in charge of the Children's Services Act for at-risk youth and families. They have four full-time and one part-time employees. <clears throat> Fire and Rescue Department, I'll say this is probably it's one of the most important departments we have, but it's also the one that has really grown the most. And a lot of that has been just the changing dynamics of volunteerism, uh, the loss of volunteers, um, and the, the increased demand for paid staff. But uh, they're uh, under the supervision of the fire chief. They provide operation emergency service response, fire prevention, education, pre-planning investigations, training, cost recovery, and emergency management. Uh, currently have 31 full-time career responders, six office staff, 12 part-time career responders, and about 40 active volunteer responders. When I say 40, when I came here 24 years ago, that number was probably 120, at least three times probably higher. So that's part of that changing dynamics. And the, it's something that's going on nationwide and across the, the state and country. It's just, it's not something here locally. Um, we all struggle to recruit and retain volunteers. And part of it is uh, the increased training demands that have been placed on our volunteers, particularly on the medical side. General Services is responsible for construction and maintenance of county facilities, including project management, custodial services, and grounds, uh, prepare plans and schedules for future capital expenditures, process vendor payments for all associated bills, um, annual budget preparation, have seven full-time and one part-time employees. Parks and Recreation, uh, Supervisors directs the activities, the use of public recreation facilities such as athletic fields, courts, playgrounds, pool, golf course, and parks. Inspects parks daily, prepares maintenance work schedules, checks completed jobs, coordinates rentals for all park facilities and applications for rent, uh, recreation activities. When I say rentals, that's everything from say a shelter rental down here at, at Burrow Brooks Park to renting a room at the community center to have a birthday party. They do all those types of reservations. Um, process requests for information regarding recreation aquatic programs, interpret rules, policies, and regulations, schedule athletic field usage for all the various uh, teams out there. Annually, they coordinate policy department planning, uh, plan, organize, promote, direct, uh, conference of athletic parks direct programs for all ages. Uh, this morning, I was at a youth basketball league game for my son who plays in the parks directly. Um, they develop year-round program of varied recreational athletic activities for all groups, ages, and interest levels. Prepare department activity brochures. Uh, maintain and operate the pool complex, golf course, Bean Crosby Stadium, Skyline Soccerplex, uh, Warren County Health and Human Service, athletic facilities, 
for the enjoyment of the general public, inspect grounds and facilities to ensure they're maintained in a safe, clean, and attractive condition. 17 full-time and 60 part-time seasonal employees. As you can imagine, we get to the summer, we have lifeguards in the pools and concession stand managers and uh, part-time mowing crew. That's when we really ramp up uh, with staff for the year. Planning and Zoning Department provide general information to the staff boards and commissions and the general public. Uh, provide administration of the County Planning Commission applications. Staff reports to the commission, the board of supervisors. Uh, administration of the county zoning ordinance, including enforcing the ordinance and correcting violations, checking building permits for compliance with zoning ordinance, work with the Board of Zoning Appeals, coordinate zoning ordinance amendments, they're responsible for the addressing of new structures in the county, and assist the applicants in filing for variance, variances, conditions, permits, and rezoning applications. They also coordinate development approvals with other outside agencies write grant applications, enterprise zone applications, and other specialized planning project applications. Annually, they develop the implementation of the comp plan, prepare a report of the department and planning commission, and implement the goals of the board of supervisors and the planning commission. They also, uh, again, develop every two years a revised capital improvement plan. And they have five full-time and one part-time employee in that department. Public Works Department, uh, they supervise the solid waste collection and disposal. So, if you live in town, odds are, odds are that you know, Joe, one of his trucks comes by and picks up your trash, a blue can, and takes it away for you. Joe's trucks then haul that trash down to Bentonville, to what we call the transfer station. The trash is unloaded off their trucks, it's loaded by our crew into a tractor trailer, and then, and then when that trailer is full, it's hauled to the Battle Creek landfill down in Page County for disposal. So Joe's, when he, when he drops on the tipping floor at, at Bentonville, his job's over. And then we pick up, so, and we pay for the disposal of the residential trash, and they, they pay us for the commercial trash they pick up, but we're responsible for the residence trash disposal, whether you're in town or county. Now, if you live out in the county, like I do, I, I take my trash this morning, I took mine, uh, um, into the compactor site there at 522. So we operate compactor sites at Shenda Farms, out there at the park and ride at 522, down at Linden, and there's one off 340 South, and we also have the ability to take it to the transfer station. So it's the difference, if you live out in the county, you're responsible for taking the trash as opposed to having someone come to your curbside and pick it up. Public Works Department also maintains four sanitary districts, um, a sanitary district basically is a special tax district. And for the most part, in these four that we maintain, it's really we're helping maintain the road systems of those communities. Um, it's hard to believe. Shenandoah Farms, uh, Joe's slide said 65 miles of road in town. Shenandoah Farms has 42 miles of roads just in that one subdivision. We maintain, and most of those are gravel, or I would call it dirt and gravel. Uh, we also maintain Lake Fretwell, Linden Heights, and Wildcat Drive. We have 10 full-time and 24 part-time employees. Uh, just an example, last um, Sunday, snow removal, we had seven plow trucks working just alone in, in Shendo Farms, uh, just that one day trying to get things cleared up. Yes, ma'am? Why is it called a sanitary district if it's for roads? Sanitary district is a, uh, it's a term of art of the Code of Virginia. It's a special allowance in the Code of Virginia for a special taxing district for a multitude of uses, which includes public water and sewer, and sanitary district. Right. But you can also do roads, you can do police service, you can do fire and rescue services. There's probably a list of about 30 things you can do in a sanitary district. But in Warren County, for the most part, they're utilized simply to maintain roads. Good question. Good question. Yes, sir. Uh, so in Warren County, you're saying those four areas you maintain roads, correct? Correct. But that means the other places in Warren County you don't, right? Correct. So if I live in one of these areas, I pay a special tax okay. that goes to a fund to take care of all the expenses associated with the maintenance and improvement of those roads. So the idea is that I, who doesn't live in one of these four, don't pay money to help fix their roads because they're responsible for it. And, and one, of the, one of the realities of Warren County is that, and this goes back to the 1950s, 
We have lots of private road subdivisions in Warren County. And part of that is the fact that Warren County didn't have a zoning ordinance until 1973. So you have developers who are out there carving up land into these little lot subdivisions, right? And unfortunately, they weren't required to build state standard roads to serve those subdivisions. So they left, the developers moved on when they sold the lot, and they left it in the hands of the HOAs, right? So you have some HOAs that their rates were set at like $100 a year, and you could raise it by $1 a year. Well, $100 or $120 is not going to pay to improve the road today when a load of stone costs you over $400 to have it delivered. So the sanitary district concept is a way around that situation by creating a special taxing district where a different rate can be set, fees can be collected like taxes. Individuals, by paying that as a tax, not an HOA fee, uh -huh. if I itemize my federal income tax, I can yeah. possibly deduct that. So there's a financial advantage for that as well. So if you wanted to have an area under this, yep. would you then go to the county and ask to do it, or do you have to have it? Yes, and, and actually there's a, there's, a, there's a very specific way it has to be done, but Basically, I'll give you an idea. The Board of Supervisors on Tuesday will have a public hearing on a request to create one that includes about 12 lots. But basically, you start off with, you need to get more than 50% of the registered voters of this proposed district to say, dear board, we'd like to create a district. And, uh, and that gets the ball rolling. But if you're interested, you please come talk to me. A lot of us live in private subdivisions out there. And Tricia, you do as well. You know, areas like that where, you know, maybe this concept could work. Um, reality, there are over 200 and some private subdivisions in Warren County outside town limits. We now have 12 sanitary districts. You know, potentially down the road, it could end up being more. But um, in those private subdivisions, what happens is you guys that are whoever may end up being on the board of directors of those HOAs or POAs, you have to sue your neighbor to collect the money. You know, it gets contentious because you have to go against your neighbor. So I used to be the secretary for a homeowners association, High Knob, which is now a sanitary district, and I had to write the letters and say, you know, you haven't paid your tax, your HOA fee for two years, and we're going to take it to court. And it gets pretty contentious, but. Um, this is a way, an alternative to that process. So anytime after, I'd be glad to talk to you about it. But we have uh, 10 full-time, 24 part-time employees. And again, uh, we maintain over 50 miles of roads with our staff, and that's covered by the, the, the fees that are paid for by those individual districts. Again, here's just a couple of pictures. This is the transfer station. So the, the town's trash trucks with a private haulers that the county uh, contracts with. They bring the trash in, unload it. It's loaded in tractor trailers. There, there's, a tra there's a trailer right there pulled in the back of the building. And they load those trailers and haul them off to the landfill. And this is a picture of the Linden compactor site. That's where you can drop your trash off, drop your recycling off. Yes, Patricia? What happens to the materials that are recycled? Good question. All right, and it varies depending on the, where the market is. Um, obviously, things like metal, uh, I think currently we're using uh, Zuckerman metals out of Winchester. We sell the metal. Um, paper is sold. Plastic is sold. The plastic is tough to find in the market. Uh, glass is actually crushed and used as landfill cover at the Battle Creek landfill. They have to cover um, the trash each day either with gravel, dirt, or they can use crushed glass as the material. There is no market for glass right now. Here. Wow. So they have to we 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 get recycling credit because they use as a, as a have a use for it, but um, there's no market in glass. Um, but certainly metals. Um, but really, um, China stopped buying recycling material. They cut back on their paper and plastic, and that's really cut into the market. Um, we ship some stuff to Winchester and some stuff to Manassas, but it keeps it out of the landfill. In the day. Social Services Department, um, we provide benefits to 9,000 residents of Warren County. You think 
we've almost got 40. So about one in every four people in Warren County receive some type of, of benefits. Um, in 2017, we had 7,703 Medicaid recipients, 5,687 SNAP, so that's the old uh, food stamp program, TANF 403, Child Care 229. We also provide energy assistance and employment service cases. Um, in 2017, we processed 3,505 new applications. In 2017, this is a crazy number, we provided $56 million for self-sufficiency, family strengthening, medical and nutritional assistance and services to eligible families. $56 million. A lot of that's federal money, some state money, a little bit of local money, but that's a lot of money going to help those 9,000 residents. Yes, ma'am. Would this be the department then that would be involved in emergency planning to provide food security on February 17 when all this is shut off if the federal government continues? Yes, ma'am. You called Deanna Cheatham, our DSS director, and talked to her. She, she would be the one to talk to. We, and we just had a social service advisory meeting this last week and we got an update report, but yes. So that, if, if it continues until February 17, then all of these SNAP and WIC, uh, also free and reduced lunches. Actually, that's managed through the school's food service system. And they've actually, even for like right now, uh, school child lunch accounts, if your parents or one of both your parents are a federal employee, they're working with folks to um, be able to extend benefits for kids that can't afford them. So you know, they're working on that. That's actually the school school system food service program. So you do have emergency plans in place then? Well, I, 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 I don't think adequate plans in place because that requires money. If you're talking about, does the county going to cover the federal government? No, ma'am. We don't have the funds to back, backstop the federal government. <coughs> but, you know, I, every, you know, obviously a lot can happen over the next month. But what I'm saying is that our friends in um, Rappahannock County are making plans. They're going into the food <coughs> There, ha There's a coordinated effort there to make sure that there's enough food for people. Yeah, and they're talking about some of those things at the local level, but it's not going to completely backstop people who need money for rent. And I'm talking about food security. Yeah, food security is a little bit easier. And we have a number of food banks, obviously, in town, ZCAP. So there, there is discussions in, uh, with those folks. But uh, I'd say at this point, not adequate. Because that's in 27 days. Yeah, not adequate. Yeah. I mean, obviously, none of us think it's going to last another 27 days. And we could be surprised. But you know, I'd encourage all of you to talk to your, your senators and your legislators. Let them know your concerns about what's happening. I can tell you that churches in this area are talking about this right now, and they're trying to be proactive. Yeah, and, and, and our strategic. And we have a, a community liaison. I'm sure you know her, Michelle Smeltzer. Oh yeah. Michelle is yeah. responsible to work with the ministerial yeah. association on those issues, and she works out of the Department of Social Services. So you can contact Deanna or Michelle about those concerns. Um, we also foster and maintain community partnerships to better identify and meet the human service needs of the county, investigate reports of suspected child and adult abuse and neglect. Um, 2017, we had 842 child protective service complaints. That's a lot. 138 adult protective service complaints. Uh, maintain ongoing and preventive services to families and elderly or disabled individuals to strengthen Natural supports help increase independence and lessen the need for governmental intervention and provide ongoing support and supervision of all foster care to birth families, foster families to strengthen all families and provide permanency for children and promote supervised adoptions. I think right now we had somewhere close to 14 kids in foster care and maybe seven, we hope in the next 60 days, will move towards adoption. So ultimately placement and, and helping kids find their forever home uh, is the ultimate answer. And, but uh, the other thing we need is we need, dearly need, um, foster care folks that are willing to foster kids in our community. Um, it's tough. We have to reach out sometimes outside the county, which puts strain on for visitation and other family members. But uh, if anybody out there is interested in being a foster care parent, 
or helping out, let us know as well. They process payroll and vendor payments for purchases, uh, provide HR management support for the department, building and fleet management, uh, fiscal reporting for all local, state, and federal expenditures, 44 full-time employees. I know Joe talked about uh, vacancies. I think I've, we've got seven vacancies right now in social services. It's a tough field. Um, it's also, and uh, I'll talk here a little bit, it's one of the things we're looking at as far as paying compensation. This is one of those areas where we're markedly below market and what we're paying our staff and we need to take a look at that in the next couple of years to see if we can address that. So with that, and we're going to turn it back over to Joe. Anybody else have any questions about county departments? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I might have missed it, but under fire and rescue, but all those local, like Rivermont, for instance. Yep. Here. So, we operate a combination fire department in that we have local independent volunteer fire companies, like a Rivermont, and then we have a county paid system. So, the individual volunteers report to Chief Manning, who's our, 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 volunteer, our paid chief, and we have a chief's advisory council, uh, which includes the chiefs and the presidents are invited to those meetings. But the, each individual department, like Front Royal down the street here, they're independent. They operate on their own, they have their own charter. Uh, they receive financial subsidy from the county, and we have paid staff in their building, but in that case, it's their building. Um, but it's a, there is a kind of tied relationship to the fact that you know we're sharing staff and resources to make it work. Yes, ma'am. Can I just give you a compliment? Yes, ma'am. Last, last Don't give me, I'll take it. <laughs> last Saturday night, I was driving home from Stephen City about 8:30. It had started to snow at four, and I, I drive a little tin can which has no traction on the road whatsoever, and it was absolutely perilous coming from where I was out to, to 522, headed toward Front Royal. The roads were white. There was nothing done. I saw a couple tow trucks. They were just driving along. They didn't have their plows down. As soon as I crossed the county line, the roads were clear. The roads were black. Oh. It was beautiful. And that, that goes to VDOT. That's not me directly, but I'll pass that along to pass VDOT. To but no, our guys, and we don't, they don't always get it 100% right. They usually do a pretty good job. They're out there trying. It could, it could have been VDOT. It was the county. And yeah. it, was, it was Warren County that was had a race. Sure, you're up. Shifting gears, I'm going to talk about the current and future projects going on in town, and then I'll finish up with a few slides on how to get involved and vote up on the town level. Uh, first thing I wanted to talk about is something that we're, we've been working hard on since 2017. We started, in 2017, we started noticing an uptick in pedestrian accidents. And so we decided that we needed to do something about it. And so what we did was in 2017, is we formed a, a committee and started brainstorming. And we came up with a campaign called STOPS, uh, Smart Towns Observe Pedestrian Safety. I had a staff member that came up with that, did the design for us with the crosswalks, kind of a little beetle thing going across the crosswalk, crosswalks there. Um, but what we were seeing is just a continual uptick of pedestrian incidents. And so what we did was in 2017, we decided to, to take, take, uh, take an active role. What we did first was education. We developed a campaign, we got us a slogan, we went out to the public and we hit all the civic events we could. We went to the schools, we went to the young driver class training, senior, <coughs> senior senators, anywhere we could to get the word out. Also another piece of the puzzle was infrastructure and that required money. I got to hand it to town council. They recognized the need and they came up with additional money. One of the things that you will notice since 2017, we have started to upgrade our crosswalks. Prior to 2017, our crosswalks were just two solid white lines from one end of the pavement to the other. What we recognized was that was getting confused with the stop bar where you would have to stop for a traffic light or something. So we ended up going out and spending over $100,000 updating every crosswalk with it to have that hashed out thing that there's no confusion. When you come up to an intersection, you know exactly what that crosswalk is. We also um, 
We also started doing the third component, which is soft enforcement. Trying to enforce um, jaywalk. We actually, in 2018, we, we um, created an ordinance and put it in the code to address the violation of jaywalking. Nine out of ten of the incidents we've seen over the past two years have been incidents when the pedestrian is outside of the crosswalk. They are walking mid-block and not walking in the designated area. Several other things that we've noticed when we started looking at the statistics, we have two hot areas. Over there on Shenandoah, um, between 14th and 17th, where you go across the bridge. And then the other hot area is right here on South Street. South Street. And so we've been addressing that. We've been looking at a solution possibly on Shenandoah, put what we call a mid-block crossing to allow citizens across the street. Um, we put that project on hold because there's some talk about a Wawa going in on the other side of the street where Shenandoah Motel is. And so if we feel that that development will proceed, that will probably stop the need of people crossing the street from the hotels to go to Speedway. So we kind of put that on hold until we find out what's going on there. But we're making, we're, we're making, uh, we're trying to make as much effort as we can. Unfortunately, we're not seeing the numbers tick down. And that's, and, and that is what we're going to get back, the committee's getting back together here in February to discuss what our next steps are. We're addressing it, we're, but we're still seeing we're still seeing an uptick. And a lot of times, like I said, it, it's either the pedestrian's, in, pedestrian's fault for walking out of it. They're wearing dark clothing. And one of, the, one of the prime times that we see all pedestrian accidents is right at dusk. Because that is the darkest point. And so, obviously, big investment in lighting is what we're looking at next. Got to invest in better lighting to light up the roadways for that the pedestrians will be seen. Um, here, Chrysler Road Bridge project. We just finished this in November. Uh, it was a project that got delayed for a couple years um, due to construction costs as well as some easements, but we did get started in June. Our hopes were to have this project done in three months to lessen the impact to the school. Uh, unfortunately, last year, as you all know, we had one of the rainiest seasons ever. And with rain, um, we had not just rain as delaying construction, but also with the, with, the, with the creek being up, it delayed some of our construction costs. But um, at the end of the day, though, we did get the bridge open in November, and uh, it turned out to be a really nice bridge. Police, the new police headquarters. <coughs> uh, this is located up on 900 and Monroe Avenue. Uh, I hope that we will be in this by March of this year. What you're seeing is the front part of the building. Uh, this is a uh, architect rendering of the building. It's the main building. It's going to be 15,000 square feet. It's going to hold administrative offices, patrol division, communication division, uh, CID, which is criminal investigation division, our detectives. And then we're actually going to have a small community meeting room in that first building for the community to use. Then the second building, there's another rendering of, um, of the second support building. And the support building is um, approximately about 7,000 7, square feet. This is going to house the evidence, evidence room. Uh, it's going to house our canines. As I told you, we have two canines, so it'll be canine uh, kennels in this support building, as well as for the, uh, our emergency service team, as well as bike patrol, garage bays, armory, and that sort of stuff. So uh, we did start this project in November. Uh, we've hit delays this summer. Again, all rain, rain, rain. It, uh, it, it played a havoc on every project that we had going on this last year. But we're, we're at the end here, and like I said, I anticipate by March we'll be in this new facility. All right, I want to talk about two projects that's going on at the Royal Phoenix site, right across the street from the new PD. Uh, we're working on what we call the Royal Phoenix Pump Station, and this is uh, to support the sewer service for the Royal Phoenix site. What we're doing here, we started this in June, and we shall finish in February. Uh, we're spending about half a million dollars, but this will serve 4,600 employees out there. 
So we know the first project's coming in with IT Federal. And this is where IT Federal is, right in here. So that'll be, it'll serve there, but that, what we're, that infrastructure we're putting in there will serve 4,600 employees. So that, that Aftec site, Royal Phoenix site could get built out probably about 75% before we'd have to do anything else. It all depends on what industry goes in there. Uh, as part of that, we're building a new West Main. And then we're just, right now, the first project is just the first phase, which is 800 feet, which will lead to the plane and feed the, feed the first parcel there, which is IT Federal. Uh, we should be able to get that finished hopefully in February. The only thing that won't be completed in February will be the final pavement. We have to wait until the paving, uh, paving uh, plants open back up in the spring. Uh, community development block grant. Uh, a lot of great things are happening downtown with this community block grant. Um, one of the bigger things is the facade program. Um, on the right there shows you the, the uh, downtown revitalization area that is impacted by this. Uh, but what I thought was interesting um, is that this process didn't just happen overnight. It actually started in December of 2014 when the town council approved an envision, envision front row. Um, and then proceeded on by in November of 15, they applied for a planning grant to prepare this revitalization plan for downtown as it was recommended through the vision. And it wasn't until 2016 that the town was awarded a planning grant and we were able to hire um, Northern Shadow Valley Regional Commission to develop this plan for the downtown. Uh, we completed it in March of 2017, but as you can see, it wasn't until January that the governor actually announced that we awarded, got awarded this grant of 700,000. We did ask for a million, uh, but we awarded 700,000. Um, but just to give you an idea, this it was a four-year process. It, it takes a while. So are there any visible signs of this now? We're just getting started. Just to give you an idea, we're meeting. We got a, actually, January is when the governor awarded it. We didn't actually sign the contracts until probably September or October. This starts a two-year time frame. So now that the clock started in September, I guess it was. I'm not too sure if it was September or October. I got one of my project management teams in the audience here, Linda. Um, but all this stuff has to take place and be completed in two years. As you can see, the big item is the facade improvement program, which is valued about six, 672000 The other is the outdoor gathering space. Um, the outdoor gathering space is down at the gazebo area. We're going to, it's supposed to be eventually going to be an open air pavilion there and bathrooms. Long overdue bathrooms down there, especially the type of vent suite handle in the community down there and not have bathrooms. Um, there's streets, streetscape improvement plans, parking and alley improvements. This, we're actually also going to do another parking study. There's still some parking issues in downtown. And so we're going to do another study to, to, to determine how we can accomplish better parking. Um, and I have the Royal, Royal Shando Greenway up there, 400,000. The reason I brought that up there, that is the, the trail that we did, finished, uh, I guess, uh, of the summer was Chrysler Trap here. As any grant, you always have matching money. You've got to match money. And so what we're able to do is we're able to use in-kind projects and in-kind labor to leverage against that 700000 So we were able to leverage 400000 for a trail. We wanted any, but we were able to leverage that as part of this grant. And then there's some signage and branding. Uh, but we're just getting started on this. I mean, it's a two-year process. And like I say, the, probably the biggest impact you're going to see is once they start the facade program. Mm -hmm. so there's about 30-some business owners that have signed up that are interested in this facade program. So. Oh, another project that we're working on is on the 522 corridor study. We, um, we uh, since Dominion Energy Resources opened up out there with their um, gas-fired power plant, they want a redundant water source. And right now, we have a, basically a radial feed that goes across the bridges and feeds the corridor there. 
these <clears throat> the businesses along Walmart, Target goes up, these Blue Ridge shadows and goes on up to Family Dollar and that. But there is no loop. So when Dominion uh, Dominion came in here, that was critical for them. So they when we signed a contract with Dominion, they decided that they would help us build a loop. So right now we're currently looking at all types of different alternatives to have a loop water system out in the corridor. Either parallel the existing line, but on the opposite side of the street, or coming across country, going across the rivers, going across country, and having the true loop. Right now we're performing a study to find out what the cost is constructability with the river, with I-66, with the railroad, um, and any other type of uh, easement issues that we may inquire. We hopefully will bring this to council in February or March to decide what the next step is. Um, we did, yeah. Is that area outside the city limits? Yes, it's outside the port lines, yes. And you're with the city? Well, we're with the city, but our water and sewer supports the port. Just as well as we have some electric customers, customers actually out in the county up on Brown Town Road, up to Stone Hollow. Uh, one of the other things that we were working on, and I was hoping, but it just didn't pan out, was washing gas and light is still considering on bringing natural gas into our community. And I started talking to them about a year and a half ago, but I was hoping, hoping, <coughs> that we could share a ditch to go across country back here, because washing gas and light's interest is in the new development, obviously. It's a cleaner, a cleaner build for them. Um, but they've kind of, uh, they kind of grown quiet, and I don't know uh, where they're at in their study, except that you know, they keep telling me that they still have interest in bringing natural gas into this community, which would be a big economic boost for us. Pending projects. This is another one. Started in 2014 as uh, another grant to do a sidewalk from John Marshall up Westminster to the high school. We started this in 2014. I finally got approval in December to approve my construction contract. So uh, we're going to hopefully begin this in spring, and we'll, we'll do a sidewalk all the way down Westminster to the high school. And this really fits into what we completed this year. If you look. Here's the library. We completed this trail right here, East Chrysler Trail, this summer. Since we've done that, we now have a complete loop around town, almost 4.45 miles that you can actually, and that is cool. And it's, I still don't think people know that that loop is complete now and that you can make a complete loop. And another thing too, what we did was we installed lighting on this here. Going up Chrysler as well, there's lighting on the trail that goes along Hampton Creek. So, um, another major project is on Hampton Creek Road. Um, it's phase two and phase three right there on the other, on both sides of where the Leachman Park is basically. You got phase three and phase two. We have submitted uh, funding options with VDOT to try to get some assistance either through smart scale or revenue sharing. This project here is a $16 million project, and probably we probably won't look at any movement probably till 2024. Um, but there's a lot of things that need to go, a lot, a lot of things that need to start right now, such as preliminary designs, easement activities, easements, acquiring easements, and everything else. Um, so this is a big project that's a priority of council as well because of the S curve got the new school out there, and you got a new hospital, and you got the limited access to uh, Leach Run Parkway. So this is a big priority for the town as well. And, and you can see up there the design. It's still going to be a two-lane road with, with bike, bike paths on, on uh, bike lanes on both sides with one sidewalk. Is there a, a way to get a picture of the previous slide? Yeah, actually, that's a brochure. Is it? Okay. Yeah, um, and I didn't bring any with me. You go to the reference desk and get one of the day. Huh? Go to the reference desk. Oh, there's one. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah.
All right, now this here is a, a good picture of the Aptek site, Royal Phoenix site. Um, as you can see, we're doing this right here where this cul de sac is. We're doing this first section here, which is about 850 feet. It'll feed the first lot here, which is IT Federal. And then you can see the other lots that, <coughs> that West Main will continue down and up and connect right up with our existing West Main. There's about six lots in there. But until we see any movement in here, um, until we see any movement in here, I don't think, I don't anticipate us building this road right away. So, but that will be a continuation of West Main. Uh, how to get involved. And I only got a few slides here, and so I'll go through them and then I'll let Doug finish this out. Um, obviously, the first thing you can do is observe local government action. Um, I think knowledge is power, and that's how you get started. Um, we do have works. We, we meet every Monday, except if it's a fifth Monday. So, first and third Mondays of the month are work sessions. We hold those at town hall. That is where a lot of the work is done in work sessions. They talk freely, they work out, they debate on what the issues are, what the policies they're trying to do. All our meetings start at 7 p.m. Unless sometimes it will start earlier, but it's due to a closed meeting of some sort, but not for general public, it's up normally 7. Our official meetings, um, which are the second and fourth Monday of the month, they start at 7 and we meet down at the Warren County Government Summit. Now, the good thing about our normal meetings, our normal council meetings, you can watch them live on video, or you can come back later and watch it on tape on the website. So you always have that opportunity to go and listen to it. Um, so it gives you an opportunity. The only thing is you don't have that option in a work session. So first thing is observe. I think that's, you know, just to get active is come to the meetings see what the issues are, or you can volunteer for committees. We have quite a few committees that citizens can fill. And I'll just go through these briefly here. The Planning Commission, who is responsible for making critical uh, zoning and planning recommendations to Town Council on matters related to orderly growth, development of towns such as site plans, special use permits, rezoning, uh, land developments. This commission is made up of six board members. <coughs> they meet on the third Wednesday of the month, and then they'll have work sessions if needed. Um, members must be a freeholder of the land and reside in town limits, and they're also provided a small stipend for their service. Planning Commission has been in the news a little bit. For example, what uh, Council took up on Monday <coughs> night with the um, uh, the off street parking for the Beer Museum. There was talk, you know, it went to planning commission because they were getting a variance, a request a variance. And uh, so the planning commission heard him out. He was trying to get an ordinance changed. Planning commission recommended denial. But it goes up, town council has a decision to either take the planning commission's recommendation or make their own recommendation. As you all know, they voted it down. Board of Zoning Appeals. Now, this is a little different. This is a five-member board that's appointed, appointed, they're selected by town council, but they're appointed by the clerk, the circuit court judge of Warren County. The BCA is what we call it, the Board of Zoning Appeals. They're responsible for deciding whether, whether variances from the town's zoning ordinance can be granted and to listen to appeals of administrative decisions of the zoning ordinance or to the interpretations of the zoning map where there's uncertainty as to the location of a zoning district boundary. Now that's a mouthful. Um, but like I said, it's a five-member board. Uh, council interviews them but gives a recommendation to the judge. Uh, they serve a five-year staggered term. They meet on the third Tuesday of the month. And you can start seeing a pattern. Council meets on Monday. This one meets on Wednesday. This one meets on Tuesday. Uh, to be a member, you must reside in town limits. And they're also provided a small stipend of service. I also, down here, it says found in town uh, chapter 175, 138. Everything that we do, every way we operate, is all in our code. Board of Agricultural Review, the BAR. Got the afternoon in there. The BAR is responsible for issuing and denying certificates of appropriation for construction, reconstruction, 
substantial exterior alterations, raising, <coughs> relocation uh, within the historical district and overlay. Five member board as well with a four year staggered term. Here, they don't necessarily, they can live in a county. <coughs> Also, uh, they are also provided a small stipend for service, and decisions of the bar can be appealed to town council. Uh, an example of this is when uh, the afternoon was uh, last year. There was a, a debate and talk about um, demo demoing the afternoon. Uh, they took it to the BAR. The BAR denied it. Well, the, the person uh, elevated that up to town council to consider overriding the. Uh, the uh, demolition, but um, luckily we've got a win-win solution now. They're actually in the pros of re refurbishing that project now. If you haven't been by there with the windows and everything, you know it's a two-year project, and from my understanding, it's about a two and a half million dollar investment. But it's going to be a nice gym on that corner there. I had to deal with that eyesore for a long time. All right, the UFAC committee. Now the UFAC committee is responsible for del developing standards and guidelines for planning, maintenance, dealing with trees on public property and any land disturbing activities. Um, this commission is a five member board. Um, they serve four year staggered terms. Here they don't necessarily have to live in town, they can live in the county as well. And uh, their power, every, all this can be found in chapter 156 and the town's whole culture partners <coughs> closely with the sturdy. So there's really, a, if you have an interest in anything, like if you have an interest in trees and forestry, there's a UFAC. If you're interested in planning, there's a planning commission. Um, there's ways of getting involved. Um, now this one, there's only one citizen representative, uh, but something new that we started this year was the Joint uh, Towing Advisory Board to ensure the proper storage, uh, availability, and service by persons or firms authorized to provide towing services at the request of the Front Row PD. Uh, Warren County Sheriff's Office, State Police, or any other law enforcement agencies. Seven member board, uh, and they're jointly appointed by the town and the county. Uh, basically, you have three members that are representing the towing industry, three representing law enforcement, and then one member is a citizen representative. And if you really want to get into it, you can campaign for mayor or council city. You got two years to get your platform going. My husband wanted me to ask why the internet speed is so slow. Internet? Oh, uh, the, the speed. His speed is very slow. He's an animated filmmaker. Uh -huh. He can't <coughs> upload or download. He's wondering how you could possibly support businesses here with such a slow speed. All right, again, so you're out in the county. Yeah. Not the town <laughs> limits. You need to be at least on Comcast. If you don't have Comcast, your Century Link is not going to be able to buy because basically it's going across copper. So your your the infrastructure serving where you live doesn't support high high speed enough for animation type uh, business. Um, I hate to say it, but the, I encourage people when they're looking to buy, look at all the infrastructure needs that you may have before you buy to make sure they're met. <coughs> the, the cost of bring what you need is fiber probably. And you the cost fiber. of fiber out in those rural areas is pretty expensive. And what they'd have to charge you, you probably wouldn't be able to afford. But if you can get on Comcast, you get a lot better internet speed. But if you can't, I mean, it affects me um, with my work. I mean, there's some, some companies I can't work for because of the, the slow speed. And it just seems like that there's, I'm, I'm sure I'm not alone, that there's a lot of people that their livelihoods are working for. And we have some people don't have broadband at all. There's good. There's probably 10% of Warren County has no broadband. Then you go to Southwest Virginia, 60% of the county might not have broadband. We're in pretty good shape, but the problem is if you, unless you're um, on say Comcast or you know some higher speed in town, you got better service. But if you're on Copper Pair out in a rural part of the county, I'm on Copper Pair. I'm on you know three to ten. Um, bits per whatever, but yeah, you know, it, it's I'm in a I'm in a marginal zone for internet access because I'm not on fiber optic. Well what are your plans for fixing that? Because it's entire well, one, we're not we, county's not in the business. We're we're not in the business. Now we encourage uh -huh. we obviously can encourage those folks we've been working with Comcast to expand service and they've got 
two areas in Shenandoah Farms are expanding in, in 2019 into that will provide higher speed access. Um, the areas Mr. Murray lives in the Verizon area, we were able to get Comcast extended, and that proved your yeah, game. Because you didn't have any broadband no, until no. Comcast got there. Um, individuals can pay. We will work with people. Um, it costs about $30,000 a mile to run the service. Comcast will, if the residents are willing to help front some of the money, um, I've worked with Comcast to try to um, get the residents to help subsidize the extension of service. We've done, done that in a couple opportunity places. So how come Shenandoah Farms got it and Mr. Murray's got it, but Rivermont didn't get it? Well, Rivermont has Comcast a lot of areas. I don't know exactly where your house is. There's one on Walnut Court, right there by the river. Yeah, you're on Catlett Mountain Road going yes, around the loop. Yes. Yeah, and they've got Comcast service, I believe, up top of the, the subdivision. Just got it here last year. If you live on that, um, what's that oak hole? I'm trying to think of if I were. Right uh, at the river, right? I know where you're, I'm talking, right above your house. Yeah. Right up there. Yeah. They just got Comcast service this past year. I don't know if it comes around the loop or not there. It, it's all about density per mile. If you have 30 houses per mile, Comcast now will come in. A lot of the areas that we have, there's like 10 houses per mile. It's not enough. So if you get your neighbors and they're willing to help subsidize Comcast, we can get them to come back and take a look if you guys are willing to help pay to upgrade the service. What is that plan called? You, it's, it's a telecommunications plan. We actually no, have what, what you get the neighbors together to, to, to Oh, basically, what is that there's called? no official name to it, but if you yeah. say, Mr. Stanley, I'm living on Walnut Court. <coughs> We've got five neighbors. We'd like to get uh, Comcast service. Uh, I can get Comcast to come out and take a look, look at the density, and look at the cost to extend service to So serve. you're the man to call? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you. It would seem to me, though, that that would be of more interest. You know, you mentioned earlier about promoting um, Front Royal and, and um, trying to make it more inviting for people. And, and that's a big one that's not making it very inviting. It's, you know, CenturyLink is just horrible. Yeah, I mean, we were out of phone service for a month and a half because they couldn't. And, and, and there's the problem is there's nobody else beating the door down to come in to compete against them. But, well, I, I just think that it should be something that, you know, it's a critical need. need. Absolutely. It's a critical need. Don't disagree, and I guess that's the question. Should the, should the public sector be paying for utilities? Should tax dollars be used to subsidize for that service. Now, the state of Virginia is putting money into, the governor's got a plan to go into low, low volume areas to help improve access. But a lot of times, and you can, you know, it's a struggle. If you have limited dollars, do you spend them in the schools or do you go out and put, do you bring broadband to say Panhandle Road out off 619, way out there along the mountain? Where do you pick the, where do you put that investment in those dollars? Like Patricia, where she lives, pretty low density, one house per 20 acres. You know, those are the areas that are tougher to get to and serve because the density is so rural and so low, um, and and the the dollars aren't there to go and invest at thirty thousand dollars a mile to serve five houses. It's tough. What about tough. the other counties like Rappahannock? They're much lower percentage. We're at ninety percent. But one of those okay. counties did a terrific job with their schools, and they got. Uh, yeah, but see, the, it's your school. Our schools all one hundred percent connected. Right. With fiber, highest level. We got T three lines for every school. Right. We're covered. We were covered long before they were. They had a plan. They had to go out because they had these rural schools and go out connect them. We're fortunate. All our schools are in and around town where we have one hundred percent fiber coverage. Uh, we didn't need to run a, you know, five miles out and pick up a school. So we had the car. So if you can do it for schools, why can't you do it for houses? Because <laughs> the government, local government is not in the IT business. We don't run like it's a private sector business. So, in, in, so basically the private companies are saying, hey, it's got to be a certain threshold before we're willing to make the investment to extend service. Well, if we're going to put two or $3 million in, the, the, you, the residents, have got to pay us back. Now, Comcast will come if you're willing to possibly write the check and help underwrite the deal. So it sounds like you may be willing to put some money into it. If uh, the other problem is, 
if Comcast runs the lines, there's no requirement that people hook up. And what they do, sometimes they'll go run the service, have people say, I can't afford to pay $100 a month for internet, and they won't sign up. So it's, you know, again, you make that $30,000 investment, and you sign up five customers at $100 a month, the return's not there for the company to provide the service. And it's so low density, you know, some counties have gotten into trying to create some broadband initiatives and put in towers and wireless, but you have to have a certain threshold to make it financially viable. And uh, we're so spread out, these little pockets of service are pretty spread out. So you're viewing it as more of a business than a need, like a safety need almost. Absolutely, to be, yes. To it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a business decision. Now, I mean, so one could argue to, that it's a safety need to be hooked up to the internet. I, I don't know if I would 100% agree it's a safety need. It's a convenience. It's an inducement for business, home business, and things like that. Um, and you could argue safety for the home camera systems and things like that, but uh, the investment dollars are so high. And again, I encourage people, when they call me, before you make that decision to buy, check out the internet speeds. What do you need before you make the investment? It's like, you know, we came from Arlington with 50, and now we have three. I've got about three at my house out at the golf course, mm -hmm. north of town. Yep. Does the county have any leverage on the central link? Because she mentioned that we small. were good without phone services because granted we're a small community, yep. but the where property you, where you goes? we're an Austin lane. Okay. All right. We're a little, uh, yep. 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 So absolutely 100%, shoot me an email. I do have the ability. I do have some contacts to be able to talk to at CenturyLink. It's tougher, but... Um, yeah, speaking of safety, I mean, our... Because it's shit. Phone service, out, our absolutely. Our phone is out for a yeah. while. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then our... Even on our road, I mean, this service is out today. Your phone. Our service is always going out. And, yeah. you know, they need to take care of And the Public Service Commission doesn't really do anything. Right. The SEC oversees, you know, in the TORC, I got the same contacts too. And, but I would encourage you to say, look, hey, Doug, phone service is out. Give us, you know, can you check one for us? Um, but again, you're a couple miles long, 12 houses, very low density. It's hard for, you know, Comcast is going to come and make that investment, per se, to get in there. Could zoning um, do anything to change that? I mean, if there was like a setup where you had options to develop a whole neighborhood and it made that qualification of having you know, enough people to invest that money by the company, by the company, not the town or the county. It made it worth their while because there was a zone, like, like you live in a neighborhood where every two or three miles there's like 40 houses or 50 houses or something like that. All right, so first of all, they look at density. Mm -hmm. You're saying build more houses to get more yeah. internet. Yeah, if you build so more if houses. at a neighborhood like that here, yeah. like another sanitary there, or whatever, here, 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 and here, then they could all be connected by Yeah, if you build more there. houses around you, yes, you would you'd be more attractive from a business standpoint to bring internet service in. But then you get into issues like water and sewer and septic systems. And you have to and pay for all that stuff. Yeah. 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 And I, you, you might create more problems than you solved in that case. <laughs> If we can, let me transition because I know we want to be out of here in 40 minutes and uh, we can always come back and we can talk a little bit after. All right, so we're going to talk about current projects in the county. First of all, Warren County Public Schools. Um, we've made a lot of progress in the last 10 years as far as construction of the new high schools, the uh, uh, renovation of the old high school to the middle and the creation of the new middle school. Um, we've been, just completed work uh, down at Rusty Jeffries where Joe was talking about along Chrysler Road, but here with all the uh, road improvements, we've also made improvements to uh, Rusty Jeffries Elementary, which was built in 1959. AS Roads, I believe at 1926, I think. It's one of the oldest schools in Warren County. Um, we're working on a plan, the school system is, to uh, replace the uh, old boiler system and the window air conditioning units with the new central air system and replace the uh, uh, asphalt shingle roofs on the roof. 
uh, and they've awarded an engineering contract to get started to get that project rolling here in the next year. I think this summer they're hoping to get some of that work completed. <coughs> Parks and Recreation, one of the projects we've been working on um, out at Rockwell Park. We had an opportunity, uh, Royal Farms, and they're building that convenience store out there. They had um, a lot of extra rock and dirt they had to get rid of, tens of thousands of yards of material. <coughs> We actually took it, this is uh, the road, Fishnet Boulevard going into Rockland Park, and we basically got them to fill in some holes uh, at their cost to bring the material, and then we placed it and uh, we're building some practice fields and stuff out there. Um, long term at Rockland Park, which the county um, lease purchased in 2005, we're going to uh, renovate the old bathhouse out there uh, for uh, be able to handle activities and events. Used to be a stage on the property. We eventually want to build a stage. I think the goal is to have a community facility where festival events, the larger venue stuff, can happen. Um, I'm not talking about building a Nissan Pavilion, but I'm talking about an event. If you want to have two or three thousand people in a festival event, we can hold it out here at Fishnet. This was a 219-acre uh, property that um, uh, was getting ready in 2005 to be sold into. 20 acre lots and go on the market. Uh, has about 1,600 feet of river frontage along the Shenandoah. Um, and uh, the county stepped in and bought the property before it was developed and had slowly been building it. To date, we built a playground, a walking trail. If you haven't been out there, we've got a couple series of walking trails that's connected over to the front row golf course. Eventually, we want to add some adult park and some other options in addition to a new. Uh, amphitheater facility <coughs> at the property. Down, anybody been down to the new Morgan Ford Bridge, across the Low Water Bridge? There's a little, I'll call it a boat landing, I'm, I'm being very generous. There's a dirt hole <laughs> here beside that folks for the last hundred years have been uh, pulling their boat in and out of. Uh, there's no real ramp and there's no real parking, it's just kind of a place where people can go in. And come to find out, the state, Department of Game and the Fishery, there's a little sliver of land here, but the county was able to work with a neighbor who donated a portion of land, and then we also bought a little bit of property off of it, and we're about ready to get some grant funding to be able to uh, put in a permanent boat landing facility here. And we've got another one we just built um, a couple miles downstream that once completed, you can come in here and put your boat or canoe in and do a nice little half mile float, but uh, really improve fishing and public access to the river. <clears throat> so we're hoping to be able to complete this project for this year. We're working on an agreement with the state. They're actually going to build the ramp and we'll take care of the parking lot and then we'll maintain the thing when once it's completed. Um, Thompson Kiss and Ride, uh, this is actually, it's a bus stop. And uh, it looks pretty simple, right? It's actually been a pretty complicated project, and I'll explain why here. So, again, for those, anybody that might live on a mountain subdivision, like a Blue Mountain or a Hinehog or Shenno Farms, um, these are all lots. I call them, it's a paper subdivision. It was drawn on paper, and you look at the topography, and it's like this on the side of the mountain. This is Friesland Road that runs up to the actual the tip top of the mountain. This was put in, these lots were sold as kind of recreational weekend subdivision where you would come out of Northern Virginia and camp on your lot and, you know, this is great, right? You spend the weekend in, in the beautiful Shenandoah Valley. But what's happened is, since the 60s and once they opened uh, I-66 in the 70s, this is now permanent subdivision. The homes that are built here aren't really used just for a weekend anymore. They're permanent with people with kids and um, there are people that uh, go to school systems and they have to get rid of their trash and all that stuff. And one of the problems the school system had is these are all private roads, so school buses don't ride back in here and pick up school kids. Plus, some of them are too dangerous or too steep. So at each of these points where the road comes out and hits the state road, you'll end up in the morning with like 15, 20, 25 cars all trying to drop their school kid off to catch the bus. And what inevitably happens is there's no room for the parents to pull off. It's not safe for the school bus. So one of the problems, the school board came to us and said, hey, we need help. We need a place to pick up the kids. 
So we started working with the Department of Game and Fisheries. <clears throat> this is the Thompson Wildlife Management Area. Um, this is actually, um, this is a fox vineyard up there on top of the mountain. <clears throat> but they, um, they agreed to donate two lots to us. They gave them because the lots on the other side of the road, they really couldn't be used for hunting. And they said, hey, we'll work it. It actually had to go to the General Assembly. The state had to give us those lots. <clears throat> that took a couple of years. But at the end of the day, <clears throat> we came up with a plan to utilize the property. So we put in a bus turnaround. We built the shelter. And we put in a parking lot so that parents can come and drop their kids off. We've got the um, Warren Coalition has donated uh, two sets of swing sets we're going to put in, and we'll work with the neighborhood to <coughs> fundraise for more playground equipment. But um, at the end of the day, they have a spot where people, especially people with special needs kids that maybe use a wheelchair, they can come here and <coughs> get, all, get their child out of the car, get them into the shelter, and wait for the school bus to pick them up. So it, again, one of those things that seems like a pretty simple project that actually gets to be a little bit more complicated at the end of the day. Fire and Rescue Services, um, Rivermont Fire Station, we talked about that earlier. So originally, this portion of the building was built in the 1930s as a community center. In 1954, uh, it was given to create the new station for the Rivermont Fire Department for the 4th District of Warren County. Um, it was expanded in the 70s and the 90s. So they added some additional bays. They had the second floor. The second floor was their social hall. It's a room not too much bigger than this room, but they could have their annual banquets and do things like bingo. It was also a polling precinct for Warren County. If you lived out in Vermont section, that's where you used to vote. Well, a few years ago, the length, the back side of the first floor, this was a, was a hill on the back side that comes up to ground level in the second, but it started, the back wall started collapsing. Water started seeping into the building. They had mold and mildew issues. The second floor a couple years ago was deemed to be structurally unsound, so they cannot occupy the second floor. We had to move the polling precinct, and they can't fundraise in the building. Our paid staff used to be there during the day, during the week. We had to move those folks out. So the volunteer department's been really struggling along. <clears throat> so we had prioritized um, a few years back to start moving forward to build a new station. We even toyed with trying to merge this station with the uh, Forceman Station. Uh, board ultimately decided to back off of that, but we decided to move forward with a new station in a different location. Mm -hmm. And the location we identified was about a mile up the street at the uh, Fort Wayne Warren County Airport. Um, which is a little bit closer to town because Rivermont also provides kind of backstop support. When you have a house fire in the town of Front Royal, one truck isn't all you send. You'll send several trucks and that'll bring them a little bit closer. Because about 60 or so percent of their calls are all back this way, either towards Front Royal or down towards uh, South Warren. So we've, uh, the estimated cost of the building is about 6.35 million. We're actually out to bid right now. Bids are due on uh, February 14th. And this is what the new fire station is going to look like. Um, it'll have three bays, but basically they'll be uh, open in on both sides. So you can actually fit six pieces of apparatus in the building, uh, two in each bay. New social hall will be over here on this end of the building. It'll also double as a uh, voting precinct. We'll be able to move that back in. <coughs> so the county will provide the building the social hall will be basically finished concrete, and it'll be up to the company to decide, hey, if you want to put in vinyl, you want to put in hardwood, you want to upfit the kitchen with the nicest kitchen equipment, that'll be on their dime and their decision, but we'll put up the basic building. <laughs> We're also looking to build a fire and rescue train facility at property we own here off of 55 East called the Environmental Study Area. We've actually already got a couple of uh, old classroom modular training buildings that have been converted to fire and rescue training space. This facility will be mostly paid for with grant money that we're going to be able to uh, already identify. But basically it's a two-story, these are um, shipping containers that are basically welded together and fabricated. And they have a, a propane fire burn system that can simulate a fire so that firefighters can go through and deal with smoke and putting out fires and training with the idea that we don't have to send our staff out to other counties to do 
uh, basic training, including our volunteers. Because what happens if you send 16 people over to Frederick County or over to West Virginia and do training, they're not here if we have an event. So this will be a lot better for us to keep them in, in, in community, plus they don't have the travel time. And it'll help our volunteers to just take a little bit less of their time they need to, to get their adequate required training. <coughs> Health and Human Services Complex. Uh, Warren County Department of Social Services and Health Department were permanently relocated to the facility in December of 2015. In 2017, we renovated the gym, including locker rooms. <coughs> Um, and then we've done a partial renovation of interior space uh, for use by the Warren County's Alternative Ed Program um, and their non-traditional programs. They moved into that space in November of this past year. And we're hoping to have the Registrar's Office move to the Government Center up there. They needed more space and we're moving them out of the Government Center. And we hope to have them moved here within the next month or two. So we look at that facility, <coughs> Health Department, Social Services, Registrar, the school's alternative ed program. This is their other <coughs> alternative ed program, which was already there. This eventually be renovated for school's uh, maintenance department. Hopefully move the area agency of aging here. This parks and rec is used in the gym. So the entire facility will have been utilized when we get finished uh, the last two pieces of the plan. Transportation project. So a couple years ago, <coughs> Joe was talking about the Half Creek Road. Uh, the state has a new funding program, it's called Smart Scale. And uh, every two years, you basically, you apply for transportation projects. And <clears throat> during the application process, they are scored against each other with all the other jurisdictions in your district. And uh, then money's divvied up from the state, and so you compete head to head, um, which uh, makes it tough uh, sometimes to get projects scored. But we looked at 10 projects um, before we made our applications. One was Route 55 and 79 down here at London, improving um, the uh, functionality of the intersection. We also looked at the intersection at High Knob, which has a large accident rate. The intersection down here at Hill and Dale by the Auto Park Auto Place that has uh, um, some issues. Um, this is the safety of the Route 55 corridor in general. Uh, we looked at the commuter lot down at Linden, which needs to be expanded again. Uh, we looked at uh, the off-bound ramp coming here off the, the actual interstate. We looked at uh, <coughs> Morgan Ford Road leading to the Morgan Ford Low Water Bridge and widening. We looked at potentially an off-ramp at I-66, add another traffic lane. We looked at lighting from North Fort Bridge all the way up through the commercial development. And then we also looked at um, providing a, a, a great separated crossing or a bridge over the railroad at Rockland to address rail backups. Every time the inland port has a service call every six days a week, <clears throat> they drop part of the train, pull into the inland port, offload cars, pick up cars, and then come back and rehook the train up. Sometimes we've had rail blockages from 30 minutes to an hour, which delay emergency services. Force the residents to take alternative routes and creates uh, a number of issues in the area. So by building a bridge, it'll make access and flow, traffic flow a lot better. So we basically, each locality, town and county, are able to put in four smart scale applications for, for each round. So every two years, you get four projects to put in. So project, the first one uh, that we put in was the I-66 Westbound ramp extension. Again, that's from where the target is down to the I-66 ramp. Right now, it's two lanes coming into town, so basically we're adding a third lane, which becomes the turn lane. Uh, we just found out this week that that's been recommended uh, for funding as number two out of 70 in the Stanton District. Uh, hopefully, the final funding will take place next June. But um, again, second highest scoring project out of 70. The next project was safety improvements on Route 55 from town limits all the way up to Route 79. That one scored number three out of 70 for the projects and hopefully include funding. And that will include things like <coughs> rumble strips on the side of the road, uh, raised pavement markers, guardrail upgrades, signage upgrades, electronic speed, uh, feedback signage, roadside lighting, fixed object hazard removal on that whole three mile corridor. Two years ago, we asked for $30 million to widen 
half of it to four lanes. And it did not score very well, so we backed <coughs> off and we did this much more meager two to three million dollar project to make some safety improvements, thinking that hey, maybe it will score better. And it obviously did by ranking the third highest project. The next project um, that we got, this one ranked number five out of 70 is again it's recommended for funding. That's through light Route 34522 from the North Fork Bridge all the way up to Shenandoah Motors. Uh, we had a fatality last year where a family, including the pregnant mother, was killed. Jeez. Their her husband's fault, he turned in front of a tractor trailer and they were T-boned, but very tragic accident. Um, could it have been, is it night? Could it have been improved with the lighting? We, and we think so. It was one of the reasons we put forth to improve the lighting for the whole section. That's the highest section of traffic in the entire county, is through that section where all the, you know, the Walmart and Target and all the shopping center is back to town. So this project will pay for lighting upgrades for that project. So that's the th three of the four projects we approved for. The fourth, and we actually pulled it in December out of the funding because we'd already received word that we got $15.5 million in federal money to build that great separated crossing for Rockland Road. So this project will move forward. Uh, we've got full funding to build a, a railroad bridge here to um, allow trains to pass <coughs> through there without having to worry about the intersection. Residents won't have to worry about it. The fire and rescue station right next door won't have to worry about being blocked out because of the railroad. <coughs> and the trains can actually, they can drop the section of train and then pull into the port and come back because the, the bridge is there. They don't have to worry about blocking the road anymore. So good news there. So all four of our projects are funded and will be built in the next five years. One of the other projects that got approved the last round was, the, this is why I guess I call it our, the county portion of Happy Creek, but it's a, a section from town limits out towards, heading down towards Morgan Ford Road. We actually have had um, at least one, if not two fatalities in the last five years, but there's a couple twists and turns here, um, and uh, include widening, uh, reducing fixed has, uh, objects, uh, improving drainage, installation of turn lanes at Dismal Hollow Road, and realigning the road at the railroad crossing to increase visibility. It's about a ten and a half million dollar project. That one's actually already gone through the public hearing process. They should be working on right-of-way acquisition, and hopefully, it will go to construction in about two years. Last thing to match Joe, get up to citizen involvement. <coughs> Again, our board, like council, we meet twice a month. We meet the uh, first Tuesday, typically at 9 a.m and the third Tuesday at 7 p.m. Uh, the, the second meeting is more of our uh, public hearing nights. We've got a public hearing coming up on the Sanitary District for Osprey Lane uh, this Tuesday. Um, the first meeting of the month is more of our kind of business meeting. We used to typically have a work session at the back end of it. We have a lot of our um, reports, say, from the town or state organizations at that meeting. But uh, we also have <coughs> a number of committees. Um, First one, Farwell Warren County Airport Commission, uh, seven members serving four-year terms, and those terms were all staggered. They're not all appointed at once. But basically, those folks oversee the um, development and operations at the airport, make recommendations to county staff. It is an advisory board, so their capacity is an advisory one only. Um, when I was talking about the new fire station, that's the location of the fire station, right there off the end of the air. <laughs> yeah. Off to the right. In the wrong way. But uh, we've got a lot of, we, own, we have bought a few years back, we bought 30 acres here adjacent to the airport, and eventually there are plans to be able to add hangars and expand <coughs> business there at the airport. Um, we're outside the Navy's, which is the air restriction zone that was established after 9-11. Um, in that zone, you have a lot tighter flight pattern of what you can and can't do with a private aircraft. We're outside of that. So you can take off at the Front Row Warren County Airport and fly around without a whole lot of hassle. We also have a great glider group. Um, and uh, 
I, I like to tell the story. I went up a few years ago. They invited me to go up in the glider. And it's a two-man glider. And I got down the nose, and one of their pilots was behind me. And you know, you get up, you're behind a tow plane, and the tow plane tows you up in the air, and then you release the cable. And as soon as you release that cable, and the tow plane flies off, it gets completely and eerily silent. And all you hear is kind of the wind flapping. At that point, I realized, wait a minute, my pilot's about 83 years old. <laughs> what ha I said, what ha if something happens to you? And he laughs and he said, oh, don't worry, you can put her down anywhere. And he let me fly the glider for a few minutes and get used to it. But, uh, yeah, it was funny, that didn't click in until that tow cable cut loose. But uh, it is a, a great asset for our community and, and uh, it uh, will continue to grow. Board of Building Code Appeals, we have five members and one alternate to serve four-year terms. They hear and determine appeals from any order, requirement, decision, or interpretation made by the building official or his or her agent, administration, enforcement of the Virginia Statewide Building Code. The Board of Zoning Appeals, like the town, five members nominated for appointment by the circuit court, serve five-year terms. They hear application for variances to the Warren County Zoning Ordinance. Community Management Policy Team, five members, including one parent rep, one private provider rep, uh, one Department of Justice representative, one board rep, and one fiscal agent. Its vision is great and maintain a collaborative system of services and funding at Warren County with child center, family focused and community based when addressing the strengths and needs of troubled and at-risk youth and their families in the Commonwealth. Front Row Warren County EDA is comprised of seven members who serve four-year terms respectively. Uh, this mission is to strengthen the industrial tax base of Front Row Warren County, to bring the community workforce home to work, to create living wage jobs for residents, and foster a healthy environment in which businesses can grow and prosper. We have a golf course advisory committee. Uh, yeah, people say, County owns a golf course? Yes. Um, back in uh, the 1930s, the Carson family um, established the Front Row Recreation Area, which includes what is now the Front Row Golf Club. Um, it was given to the citizens of Front Row Warren County, and uh, they operated up until about 2005, which time they came to the county and said, hey, would you take it over and roll into operations with the uh, county's Parks and Rec Department, which we did. Uh, you've seen the newspaper here back and forth. And there are folks that say, why is the county subsidizing the private enterprise to compete against other golf courses? And we've looked at, I think four times now, we've gone out trying to solicit other interested parties to come in and take over operations unsuccessfully. And we're trying to talk to heirs of the Carson family and others about the potential to use the site for other recreation uses other than golf. And that's, a, I guess, a, a, a final outcome to be determined. But we continue to operate the golf club. And uh, it is really one of, the, it's one of the oldest golf courses in Virginia. Again, it's um, 80 years old, and uh, it's, uh, over the years, it's had, uh, been recognized as having some of the best greens and uh, the most unique. It's a Scottish Link style golf course, and uh, a lot of the people that play golf right here started Front Royal. Northwest Community Services Board, two members serving three-year terms. Its mission is to help people through life's challenges with quality behavioral health guided by principles of respect, recovery, and self-determination. Um, so Warren County basically has two reps that we appoint. Parks and Rec Commission, 16 members, including five citizen members who serve two-year terms. Um, other members include one member of the board, two park and rec representatives, one school board rep, and several local league reps. Planning Commission, uh, five members, one from each magisterial district serving four-year terms. Promote the public health, safety, and convenience welfare of citizens and plan for the orderly development of the community by acting in an advisory capacity to the board. Again, we talked about the capital improvement plan and the comp plan, two of the biggest things they work on. Our social service advisory board, five members. We talked about concern about social services. This is a great group to get involved with. Uh, they serve four-year terms. They act in an advisory capacity to the county administrator. I am, I am actually the administrative board for the department, so the advisory board may, provides guidance to me and uh, to the social services director and, and <coughs> managing programs and services. 
We have a joint tourism board, as Joe mentioned. We work with the town to promote and advocate um, Fort Royal Warren County and its environs to folks on the outside. Um, one of the things that we did a couple years ago, we increased our lodging tax from 2% to 5%, an additional 3%, which generates almost 120,000 a year, has to be put towards tourism related items. So one of the things we're working with the town, it's kind of a cool and exciting project, is the Wayfinding Signage Project to kind of seamlessly bring tourists off the interstate into the community and say down to the amenities and places that people want to visit, whether it's downtown, Antigua State Park, Shenandoah National Park, the golf courses, brew pubs, breweries, things like that. The Joint Twin Advisory Board, again, town and county have a <coughs> one citizen rep on that board. <coughs> Other additional boards, commissions, committees include, we have a Agricultural and Forestal Advisory Committee, a Board of Long Subject Appeals, a Building Committee, Cedar Creek and Bell Grove National Historical Advisory Committee, Community Criminal Justice Board, Local Lord Fairfax College Board, Lord Fairfax Emergency Medical Services Council, Northern Shenandoah Valley Regional Commission, <coughs> and the Shenandoah Area Agency on Aging. So if you're looking for a way to serve, we are we currently are looking right now for a Northwestern Community Services Board rep. We've got a three-year term. It runs January 1 of 2019 to December 31st of 2021. Our CPMT, we're looking for one two-year parent rep. And then um, we've got citizen appointment applications available online <clears throat> and in the county administrator's office. So we constantly are advertising for people to serve in some capacity for the community. So if you're interested, go every couple weeks and check just check that one page. So every month we're putting out different stuff. And um, throughout the year we've got some appointments that come up in March, some that'll be June, July, others that are October and some at, in, at the end of the year. <coughs> but um, we also place them in the newspapers. And <coughs> you'll see them there. It's the end of the presentation. Joe and I would be happy to, we're, we're good, we're 12 minutes early. Happy to answer any questions and then we'll stay around too. Yes, ma'am. You say you meet twice a month. When do you meet? Warren County Government. So the good part is we both meet in the same building. Yes. The Warren County Government Center. So next to the post office, across the street from the fire department, Joe meets on Monday nights on the second and fourth. Second. And we're the first and third Tuesday. That's at the government center. Government center, actually. Seven, seven o'clock, Tuesday. Seven, seven, seven. Public hearing is 7 30. So we need to be there at 7 30? You get there at 7. You get there close to that. There'll be a public hearing sheet to sign up for each public hearing, so it's yours. Yes, ma'am. Is there any future plan to rezone the area where the UPS facility is now? Because the current traffic density through that area, that's Joe, a nightmare. That's a hot potato, yeah. Joe. You got that. Yeah. <laughs> um, actually, right now, UPS was, uh, they have been uh, trying to get a special use permit to use some more uh, uh, parking down there behind the front row business park. Uh, they took it to planning commission. Actually, the planning commission denied their uh, special use permit to expand. But right now, no, there's nothing right now on our radar. As long as UPS is there, I don't see that, that, that land use changing at this moment. And they have no plans of moving out of town. Your guess is good as mine, you know. you, you got to figure it's something with their outgrow their location if they haven't already. But I, I think this could be, uh, with their denial on being able to use that parking lot, it's going to hinder them because they are growing, as, as Doug said, they are growing out of their facility. They're already leasing traffic trailer space north of town. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's just a major traffic hazard through there. Yeah, it is. them turning, and, and you can't see the traffic signals if you're behind a truck. Now, on the flip side, I, I hear the citizens' concerns on the noise um, that impacts them at 2 o'clock in the morning. Right, yeah. Ben? Afternoon. Who actually owns the afternoon now? It is my understanding that the EDA has ownership of the afternoon. And I'm not 100% correct on that, but I'm almost okay, sure that they correct. own it. Yeah. And once the uh, Cornerstone Construction or whoever the gentleman is, the developer, somewhere down the line when he's completed and he's got tenants, there's all these checks and balances before it actually gets transferred back to him. Okay. 
So do we take insurance out of that? EDA would yeah. yeah, that's an EDA question. I do not know. Okay. We used to. I can check on that for you. Oh, um, I'm just curious. Of course, until I get tough, the value is about 100000 bucks. It's about the expense for right now. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And the sludge from the wastewater plant. Well, I'm waste. Ooh. Wastewater treatment plant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sludge. Sludge. Do we have to sell that now, or do we sell it, or do we haul it off? What do we do with that? No, actually, we are still trying to perfect it, but we are going to be producing what we call a Class A, which then you can use for fertilizing and stuff like that. We're still trying to, we're still tweaking the process to make that solid, because okay. um, um, there's so many standards that we have to meet to be able to give it to the public or even sell it. So we really haven't even broached that subject right now. Um, but I do know that in the past, when we had to get rid of this liquid before, or a Class B solid, it was just an, an enormous cost to that. Mm -hmm. So at this point, from my perspective, if we can get a Class A solid and there's a demand in the community, then I, I, you know, it's going to save us money by getting rid of it. And then we fix all the leaks in the water pipes so we don't pay ponds? We are, you know, we are mandated by DEQ um, due to our I and I issue. I can say that the town is putting a lot of money towards employment and filtration. Um, it's, every community deals with this, and it's all due to the age of pipes, duct, clay pipes, such as that. Um, but we are, uh, we, we do have an order by DEQ. We, we meet with them quarterly, and uh, we keep at it. We're spending over a million dollars every year on bus. How much, how much water do you treat a day, 2.2? Two? Two. And you treat 3.7? Yeah, it, that tells you right there. You've got still got I and I issues. Yeah, I've got I and I issues. The biggest impact is when we have these heavy rain situations. That's where you see you see the dramatic impact. And what happens on the flip side, it costs us more money to treat that water before putting it back into the river. So we have a lot of. You can see our budget this year coming up. We're going to spend almost four hundred thousand dollars in chemicals just to treat before putting it back. <coughs> in the river. I'm kind of confused about the EPA. Is that under You're not alone. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> is that under your... All right, so the EDA, is, it's a joint authority that's created by the town <coughs> and the county, okay? Front Royal Warren County EDA. So the EDA, in th theory, works for both of us. Since about five years ago, the county took over operational funding, 100% of the local portion of the operational funding, and the appointment of the seven members. It used to be you appointed, the town appointed three and the county appointed four, and then it changed to five and two, so now all seven are appointed by the county. So as far as where's the buck stop, board of supervisors, because they appoint the board members. But as a separate authority, those seven members are charged with the operation, the hiring of the staff, daily operations, and all that stuff. But, but the appointment comes back to the board. Where does their funding come from? So about, and this is ballpark, maybe a quarter. So maybe their operating cost each year is maybe around 400000 The county provided last year, I think it was around 108000 so maybe a quarter of that cost. The rest of it, you know, they have rental properties, uh, office space they lease, they have buildings they lease, they get rental income off that stuff. Um, they have bond fees because they've sold bonds for things like Randolph Macon Academy. They just sold some bonds to the hospitalists, so they collect bond fees and stuff off that. And that makes up some of their local, what they guess their local revenue. I mean, it almost sounds like a separate entity that kind of. It is, it is. It is. When you create an authority, you're creating a separate entity. Legal, legally, they are a separate entity. And that entity was created, I think, 1968, 69. So, long time ago, Joe and I were a little uh, <laughs> uh, created as a separate legal entity. Okay. Yes, Patricia. Um, why did the county pay 90000 and then an additional 50000 for accountants related to EDA? I've read this and I just don't understand. Um, because we needed to, we felt, the board felt it needed to. But, who, uh, but who's being audited? Who's being protected or? Nobody's being protected, what's, I think. What, the auditors the are working at the EDA, not at the county. I can say that. 
the auditors are working at EDA for EDA or for the county? The contract is with the EDA. We're paying the bill. You pay. Yeah. Why? Because we're paying 100% of the local cost uh, of operations. And you process their finances. We do not process Don't their you? finances. No. No, we are no. not the fiscal agent for the EDA. Who does that then? Themselves. And they have a separate audit that's performed for the EDA. Okay. We can appoint, but we can't remove. The EDA board has to vote to remove their own members. The board of supervisors cannot remove an EDA member. Well, now, we don't have to reappoint them. And we do have a couple appointments coming up. We'll be advertising in the next month. Two, two of the seven come up. Yeah, Correct. <laughs> Who do they what, answer to? Them? What's the status of the this IT uh, investment out in the industrial park? Joe, it's IT Federal. I know they're under construction. I don't know. Yeah, they're under construction. I know that we'll have our facilities ready for them by February or March. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as wise is their process, I know they got the first building up. I do not know the status of the interior of that building. They're still working on the, the uh, what they call Transcend Drive, which is the road that comes off of West Main and feeds into their facility. That still needs to be constructed, but I do not know the, the complete timeline for them. So how many people are they going to employ? Um, you know, originally they came out of the gate at 600. I honestly, I do not know right now. I know that that first building is approximately 10,000 square feet. I think it may be office and retail space, so I do not know what, uh, what the count will be there. Ma'am, you had a question or comment? Oh, what did you say? Who, who do they answer to? Right. The so the EDA board members ultimately answer to the Board of Supervisors. And technically the town council, but the board members appoint them. So. But it, it is a joint authority. So at the end of the day, both the, you have both council and the board. Um, so they serve at the pleasure of board supervisors. Board of Supervisors, but you cannot replace them. They're, they're on staggered terms. We have two positions are coming up next February. I'm proud of the town and all the work that it's done for the CDBG grant, and you didn't. And because of that, we only had to put in $130,000 new dollars because we had so much that we were doing and managing funds that would add to the cost. So I think that's really a plus. Oh yeah, I mean, when you look at it, we did get 700,000, but it's a value of about like 1.4, 1.3, yeah, because, is. right, we were able to use a lot of things we already were doing as in kind to match the grant money. So, like the trail on Pride Road. Like the trail on Pride Road, that was $400,000 we spent on that trail. We were able to use the credit as a, um, on a backstop with that grant. But the thinking is different. It's more business like, and it's also very uh, much oriented towards safety. For example, when you're out in the subdivisions, they're thinking of connectivity so that emergency vehicles can get anywhere at any time. But it's just a much more professional. You got the whole co between the rest of the improvements and what the town's yeah. done, this whole corridor looks yeah. completely the bridge yeah. completely revitalized this whole section. Well you also deserve kudos because you've always been so supportive to the schools. We, we, you know, we, we had to invest a lot, and we have, and, and, and I will say, you know, and the board knows this, it's, we put a lot of money into the capital, now we've got to work on the human capital side that we've had to, I, I won't say we neglect, but we've had to emphasize the capital investment. And we've got to now emphasize, the, we lost 70, we had 72 new teachers this year, too. Mm -hmm. So we've got to focus on that in the next couple of years and try to make sure we're more competitive in pay and things like that. So. You'll see that in the next couple of years, I hope. Does I have some questions? Yes, sir. Does anybody know what Warren County's named for? Joseph Warren. That's right. He was a general, Revolutionary War, killed at Palmer Hill. So there will be, in the near future, a presentation of plaques for every school honoring General Warren and is being funded by the Sons of the American Revolution. Okay. And they also have a plaque, I believe, to go here in the store. Yes, they will. That, that actually, with this week, we've got that up. Absolutely. Well, thank you all very much. I appreciate you coming and braving this rough weather. And, uh,
Anybody yeah. needs a card, you're welcome to come up, and I'm glad to yeah. answer yeah. everyone as well. We can help you moving forward on anything like broadband or some of the other issues. It's, uh, it's, unfortunately, they're not, a lot of these things are not easy answers or one-time fixes. You just have to keep plugging away at it. Eventually. The the Thank you all. Okay.